Yeah, this is... You're live, Matt. I'm live. In case you want something oh, to hold. I was going to bring mine. Who are you? Funny. My, the, okay. my thing that frustrates me about those is how they all twist around on each on uh, themselves. I have like a half size one. Okay. And it's just right Have you ever me. seen a Lostrovka? No. Come on. That's what the old Russian Orthodox use. This looks serious. This it looks is. like for like really, really It looks serious pious. and like licorice. <laughs> it does. I should show my husband. He's like a big black licorice fan. Oh, me yeah. too. Um, no, mine, I also like... Maybe this is not holy, but I cut off the, the fringe part because yeah. it's just annoying. You're like, I have not used that to wipe my teeth. I'm not. Once. No, I'm, I'm not going to start now. Listen, every time I go up to venerate the icon when I get to church, this is my prayer. Lord, you know, I'm never going to get this right, right? Like, you know, I'm never going to do it right. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of have a little chuckle with the Lord and he understands and I proceed. Beautiful. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the show. I met you because you were part of my locals community. Yeah. And I don't, I, I kind of, I mean, I know your story a little bit, but I, I forget what led to this. I know that we were chatting and I was really inspired by what we were chatting about, that you'd become an Orthodox Christian last year. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Yeah. And I found out about you and Pines with Aquinas because a friend of mine who's also Australian mm. um, sent me uh, your, your interview with Sister Miriam James. And mm. I... You know, that woman. That woman. Oh, my gosh. She's a ninja. I just felt like seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's the kind of woman that when she looks at you, you feel like the rest of the world fades away and yeah. somehow you're still existing in it. Yeah, yeah. She's a good woman. Yeah, I've been praying um, on the Hallow app. Yeah. So a little plug. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hallow.com slash yes, Matt. Three yes. months for free. Sign up there. Not on Laura Horn's page, on my page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I've been doing the um, Mary Untire of Knots. Beautiful. Novena. And the Sacred Heart as well. It's been good. That's beautiful. Um, so when you became Orthodox, were you discerning between Catholicism and or Orthodoxy? Is that why your friend sent it? or No. no? I think she just sent it because uh, Sister Miriam's story is amazing. Mm -hmm. So You know, it's funny. There is, um, just like in the Catholic community online, there's a lot of louder... Not that there's anything wrong with being traditional, but tradier people, you know. Mm -hmm. I think like in orthodoxy, you have those as well. There are people who are like really off-putting to me. Oh, really? But say things very solidly and firmly. and Sure, sure. But it's been beautiful for me to encounter orthodox Christians who like actually see me as a brother mm. and don't feel the need to differentiate themselves from yeah. me the way New Zealanders do. Oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. cool that you're using the Hello app. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I've been doing the Bible in a year with Father Mike. And yeah. Yeah, going all the way. Good stuff. <laughs> well, where do you want to start? I, I mean, I know we have a lot to talk about, but oh I kind of want to get into your story yeah. before we, if that's okay. Sure. I mean, I can start at the very beginning. All right. It's a very good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, so, which kind of has some relevance to the story overall. Uh, I was born in Germany on an army base. My father was in the army. I never met him. Okay. And uh, I was born in West Germany during the height of the Cold War. So that kind of figures into later work that yeah. I would be doing, interestingly. And I, even though we left Germany as when I was a baby, I still feel a real connection to it. Like I don't really feel American. Mm -hmm. I feel much more European. Mm. I mean, I we came back to New York and I feel like a New Yorker, but I, kind of feel everywhere and nowhere, you know? So anyway, um, the reason we left Germany was because my father was not a good person. Mm. He, um, he was abusive to my mother. And when I was a baby, she was worried that he was going to hurt me. Mm. And so, um, she fled with me and really saved my life. You know, um, it was, it was for the best, you know, I didn't grow up with a father. Um, that did you grow up in New York City? I did in mm. Staten Island, New York until high school and then the Upper West Side. Mm. So yeah. I want to just throw out a disclaimer right now that there's yeah. going to be some things we talk about yeah. that will be triggering to people. Sure. So just out of love, if you're watching right now, we're going to be getting into some issues. And if you have children, this yeah, is probably not, not, don't let them watch this. Probably not. Yeah. At least watch it before, before you make that judgment. But yeah. sorry. Yeah. yeah, sure. So. We came back and moved in with my grandparents, lived with my grandparents uh, till I was in fourth or fifth grade. 
and my mom remarried when I was four. She married a Jewish man and she converted to Judaism. So I was ostensibly raised in a, in a Jewish home. Not ostensibly, I was raised in a mm. Jewish home. Went to Hebrew school, mm. went to Temple Israel in Staten Island. And um, at the time, it was not, nothing in my home was comfortable, let's say. Um, it was, a, it was a very fraught childhood. I actually remember very little of it. And unfortunately in my, in my extended family, there was, well, in my immediate family and my extended family, there's a lot of abuse. Um, there was, we had a, uh, we had a family member who, um, I'll put the, how do I put this delicately? He, he made his way through every female in my family, uh, including me. And so, uh, if, if you can imagine my, my mom has just endured this horrible, you know, abuse at the hands of another, yet another man mm. comes back with me to try to start a new life. And then uh, when I was three, we were having dinner and I just made some comment at the dinner table because this person was present at dinner. And um, I said, oh, do you remember when you did, did that? Mm. And it was like a record scratch, you know, and everybody realized that he had gotten to me too. So the good part about that is that it stopped. How did everybody react to the dinner table? I don't know. I don't remember that. Mm. My, my mom actually only told me this when I was 16. Mm. Um, I had, and, and I was so glad she did. I didn't remember the abuse for a long, long time. And when she told me, it answered so many questions for me about things like why I didn't feel at home in my body, why I felt so confused when I would look at boys or girls and didn't know what was going on. You know, I had no, no guidance, no, uh, no parenting in that area at all. Um, so it made a lot of things make sense. So it's better to know, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Forgive me if I ask any insensitive questions. No, it's, I'm an open book. It's okay. Um, do you remember the abuse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm going to change the title. Sure. With just a warning on it. Sure. Oh, thanks. There's a, yeah, I've heard, and I was listening to a podcast today that talked about how when we don't process or heal from childhood wounds, they come back Yeah. Uh, in like f physical ailments and all sorts of things. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's certainly true in my case. Um, I've had chronic illness since I was, you know, a kid. Have you? Yeah. 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 I had uh, I had a chronic pain disorder for twenty years. Um, that's another story. We'll get you know yeah. get to that later. But uh, yeah, in this in this immediate kind of situation, um, the, you know, the other element of this was that my my mom had mental illness that was undiagnosed until I was an adult, mm. and so um, the immediate home life was was total chaos. I really never knew what was real and what wasn't. Uh, every time I thought I could hang my hat on something and, and kind of go in a certain direction, um, it would just, I, I would be derailed, you know, or I would say something that I thought maybe would um, make my mom proud or like make her my friend or, mm -hmm. you know, make her my ally or something like that. And it would be met with like the complete opposite or, you know, um, yeah, it was very, very difficult. Just unpredictable. Very unpredictable. So the, the subject of reality is really, really important to me. You know, I'm not going to call things something that they're not. So, I, and I, I do want to preface this too, by just saying I honor my mother. Mm. I started out by saying that she saved my life and mm. she set my life on a course that had it had she chosen to stay now i'm not making a theological statement here or anything like that but had she chosen to stay and endure um being beaten you know for the sake of you know family togetherness or something um my life would be completely different i i don't think i would be a functioning person mm. so i i honor my mother completely and my mother is now, um, she's taken care of, she's stable, she's mm. happy. Um, there's been so much healing there. 
So I, anything that I say about my upbringing, just I, I want people to know that that's been healed, you know. And there's still, of course, there's going to be things that, like the onion layers, mm. you know, it's going to be unpacked <clears throat> over a lifetime. But it's important how do to we, say. Uh, how do we honor our parents while acknowledging the harm they did? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it's, you know, my stepdad always used to say, uh, you know, we did the best we could. I did the best I could. And as a young person, I would feel like that was nowhere near good enough. How can you even say that to me? You know, and I would be very judgmental, angry. But I think as you get older, you recognize that the adults in your life had their own limitations, just like, you know, you have your own limitations. Yeah. And so I really do know that she did the best she could. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. she just had fewer resources to do it with you know okay yeah so living in this jewish home yeah were you ever like did you believe in god as a child i i think i did i didn't really have a lot of thoughts about god but i i did know that there was something bigger if I can, I don't think I could have articulated it, but I was a rabid consumer of fairy tales. Mm. And the fairy tales were really like where I saw the real world happening. And I, I felt like I was living in one, first of all, you know, because you always have this trope of like the simpleton, you know, like the least, the smallest, the least qualified, the the one who's always screwing up. Right. And that felt like me. I felt like that all the time. And, it's always that person that's the hero of the story in some strange way. Mm-hmm. And they they grow. And, you know, there's the usual things that are said about fairy tales and why they're structured the way they are. But I think... Say it again. What? The, the, you, the, oh, yeah, Just because yeah. they've been said, say them again. No, I, I think that... Um, so you had Nicholas Kotar yeah. on your show. And uh, he and I were having a conversation. And he asked me this question, what is it about fairy tales that you, is it the moral? And I said, no, because some of them are like, you don't even know what the moral is, <laughs> That's right. you know? But for me, it was always this theme of this, the simpleton, let's say, being, the gift, being mm-hmm. given the gift of insight and being able to see things that other people didn't mm-hmm. see. And that felt like my story. Like I felt like I could see things going on that the people around me didn't see or didn't want to see. So, for example, you know, I was largely raised by my grandparents and I would try to tell them what was going on at home and they didn't believe me. And my grandparents were sainted people. I Mm. mean, they were amazing. And yet so much went on under their roof that they never acknowledged. And when I would tell them this happened or this is going on, they would say, Oh, but they really love you. Oh, but they're really doing the best they can. Oh, as if like as the child, I needed to be the one to extend grace to the, to the grownups, you know, and I was even, I was told that, you know, again and again. So, you know, not being believed when you're trying to tell what's really going on with your story. It's really, it's hard. I was reading fairy tales to my kids the other night. I love fairy tales and I love how children are far more entertained by fairy tales than anything else. Yeah. I just love the, uh, something about the chaos that the person, the the protagonist walks into, like something that's, you know, like dig up that tree and you will find a golden chicken or something like that. (laughs) So there's something about that too, I think, that we find ourselves thrust into life with things we do not understand and do not know how to process. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, yeah, you get one of those hints like, so the golden goose is the fairy tale that you're referencing, Mm -hmm, which I've actually, I illustrated in uh, in college. It's one of my favorites. But yeah, you know, you get this kind of uh, clue. Okay, go over there to that tree, chop it down, and you're going to find something awesome. And you're like, why? What? You don't know why you're led to do something, but then all of a sudden, in hindsight, you realize, oh my gosh, I couldn't have gotten from A to B without that instigation, you know, mm-hmm. that catalyst. Okay, so you went to Jewish school, and but no kind of direct kind of communication with God. Were you taught your prayers? <laughs> How does it work growing up as a Jew? So we were a very secular household. Okay. We were like New York City, liberal Democrat household, right. you know. Um, it was really much more about 
like temple life mm-hmm. and the culture there and um, my stepdad's pride in being Jewish. And I have two sub- two half siblings who are his and my mom's kids. Um, and so, you know, they are like fully, fully Jewish, mm-hmm. you know, had bar and bat mitzvah. Um, so this was like culturally the atmosphere in my home, but because of all the other stuff going on, I don't know, it, it didn't, at the time, it didn't really take. Mm-hmm. But it was, it was part of me, you know, it's definitely part of me. Mm-hmm. So when I was 16 is when I, when I met the Lord and that's a whole other, you know, we can get there. Mm. But it wasn't until after I became a Christian that I realized what had been implanted in me, mm. in my Jewish upbringing. So now looking back at it, I, I feel like I was given a treasure house mm. because I see things there it is. in the gospels. Fame. You see things that others can't or don't. Yeah. I didn't have that upbringing. I didn't even think of it in that regard, yeah. but yeah, you know, sometimes it, you know, I'll say something about, you know, the Jewish connection to the gospels or something and it'll, people will be like, what? Just go right over their mm-hmm, heads, you know? Mm-hmm. But it's for me, I, I feel like I won the lottery, you know? It's such a rich, it's such a rich thing that was kind of tilled into the soil of my life. And I'm grateful for it. All right, so how, how do we get from there to there? How do we get from child Vespa to Christ? Yeah. Okay. So I started going to church with my grandparents when I was nine. Hmm. And so I was actually uh, had first communion and okay. confirmed in the Episcopal church. And your parents were okay with that? Your stepdad and mom? Huh? They didn't care that much? I mean, I often say I was raised by wolves. There was just so much that I did that. I was a latchkey kid, okay. you know, there, um, I don't really remember my mom and my stepdad in my childhood memories. Okay. It's just, I have a couple of memories. It's pretty blank. Yeah. Um, my mom was a nurse practitioner. She worked all the time. My stepdad worked in New York at a bank. Gotcha. He, I was alone most of the time. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> my grandparents were still a very safe place for me to be. So they would come and pick me up, bring me to church, you know, and so in middle school, when I sort of still had some childlike innocence, you know, I I went with them and I felt very, very safe right up in the front of the church, like right up, you know, I wanted to be as close as possible to them in the choir and then like to the altar. Mm -hmm. And I would even have like the desire to like crawl under the altar and just hide there. You know, I just wanted to, to be there. Mm-hmm. You know, so there was something very attractive to me about it, but at the same time, how deep did it go? I don't know. So I, uh, around that time too, I discovered that I was an artist. Mm. I'd been drawing my whole life, but I didn't realize that that was like an option, you know, and the fairy tales, it was like, oh, I want to draw fairy tales mm-hmm. like for the rest of my life. So I found out about this arts high school in Manhattan called LaGuardia High School. And uh, I applied, I got in. And I all of a sudden was commuting an hour and a half a day. At what age? At 13. Okay. Yeah, to art school in New York. Wow. Yeah. In 90s New York, by the way, which was like... Way cooler. A dream. It, <laughs> I teach there now, not at LaGuardia, yeah. but I teach in the city once a week. And it's like, oh, I, you know, to gird my loins to go back. Yeah. It's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same. But anyway. We have a link to Vespa's Instagram page and her art in the description below. I put it there yesterday, Thursday, so... Please go check it out because she's actually like shockingly good. <laughs> Not like, that's really good, but like, holy crap. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Well, there was no plan B for me. So, mm. yeah. So I started going to this high school in New so York. Did your mom care that you had got accepted to this, that you were going to this? Was she proud of you? Was it a, I, did she put up any resistance? Or? She didn't put up any resistance. Um, again, like I hardly saw her. Mm-hmm. And when I did, it was so bad. Mm. <laughs> um, I tried to be home as little as possible, to be honest with you. I did a lot of theater in high school just so that I didn't have to go home. Um, so yeah, I don't really know. Yeah. I don't really know. I know when I was applying to college, she had some different ideas for me. Like she thought um, the two of the ideas she pitched to me were um, airplane pilot and dental mm. hygienist. Oh. <laughs> You're like, no. <laughs> it's like, I'm a white knuckle flyer. 
Why those two? Those, those, so I don't know, I guess those they are felt that. very like extreme. Maybe an right, astronaut like they, or maybe stability. I don't know. Job security. Yeah. Something like, I don't know. Not artist. So you had to become an adult quickly. Yeah. 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 So because the, the idea of a thirteen-year-old commuting by bus, I presume. Oh, uh, like bus? That, no, bus to ferry in to train New York City. Subway, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. At what did I leave at? Like five in the morning, and I would come home at eight, nine at night. Did you love it? I loved every minute of it. It was, um, I'll, I'll get there. Mm-hmm. I'll get there. So when I was 13, like my freshman year, I made a friend who was really into Wicca. Mm-hmm. And there was a bookstore around the corner from our high school. And so we would go and like read the, the new age section, you know? Mm-hmm. And so she gave me a book that said that I could be a Christian and practice witchcraft. Like, cause that was this woman's story. Like she was, I think Episcopalian and she was like, no, it's totally compatible. And so because I had just had this confirmation experience, I was like, oh, well, I don't want to betray my grandparents. That was mm-hmm. really what it was about. <clears throat> I don't want to like make them upset, but this other thing sounds really amazing. And what, what about it sounded amazing? You know, it was all about control. Okay. It was all about control. It, it offered this framework to be able to control your environment, to control the weather, to control your inner state, to control the people around you, whether that was uh, through actual spells or astral projection I was really into. So I kind of like amassed this, for lack of a better term, new age kind okay. of set of practices and beliefs around me. And, and please spend some time on what might, might seem to you the mundane details, because yeah. there's a lot of people who are listening who have no idea about oh, sure. witchcraft, and I'm actually right. really, really interested. Because I'm yeah. sure when they were presenting, you can have this control, it was done in a sort of benevolent sounding oh, it, way. it sounded like a fairy tale. Yeah. It sounded like a fairy tale. It was like, and there, I think there was something about that that really resonated. Like, there's this whole unseen world that I always suspected was there and now they're telling me it's really real. Yeah. And the reality, you know, that I that I was trying to operate in and that I believed in, like I could be part of that. Are you kidding me? It was like candy. Mm-hmm. You know. So now so the, is it the girl telling you this, your thirteen year old friend, or mm-hmm. is it the books that you had started to read Both. that okay. Both. So we were really into it together. Turn this off. Yeah. And so it's important to know that this was pre internet. Yeah, I remember that. It was pre-internet and it, it was pre like Sabrina the Teenage Witch and mm-hmm. you know those TV shows and stuff. This yeah. is this is like 1990, you know. And so the only access that we had to anything was in this bookstore. And it was like a not a Barnes and Noble, but it was a a, a big chain bookstore. Okay. So it wasn't like, oh, we were going to East West Books down on uh, 13th Street, you know, it was That like, would have been cooler. It would have been the, way cooler. With a grumpy old man who runs it is upset that you've come into his door. Yeah, I love probably. Those guys. And like, yeah. it's, you know, I, I, I can't remember what East West was like at the time. It's a real yeah. bookstore, East West. Mm. Um, but yeah, you know, and we would go to like these occult shops and buy herbs and, you know, all this stuff. But we didn't know how to find other people to basically form a coven with. So what is a coven? A coven would be a, a, a group of witches that would practice together, basically. Okay. So it was just her and I kind of muddling along and and reinforcing each other and trying stuff and whatever. Um, So that was like, that was what we were into. We were also into, you know, fantasy books and dragons and lore and all that stuff. I mean, I was not your typical 13 year old girl. If (laughs) if anime were cool back then, would have you been into that? No, good. No, not anime. I didn't know it was possible to be super into dragons and. Everyone I know who's super into anime is also into like D and D. And well, my first boyfriend was into D and D, so yeah, that's my connection. Cool. Um, <laughs> no, but we were we were into like you know, oh what, you know, the Cure and okay. like oh, just yeah. anything kind of dark and yeah. and spooky and yes. um, and just like otherworldly, you know. Yep. But it was more of a. Oh, one comic we did read. We didn't read anime, but we read ElfQuest. Okay, I don't know what that okay, is. Okay, so I'll just let you imagine what <laughs> ElfQuest is. It's, okay. Yeah, it, you can still get it today. It's, it's a good, good comic. Yeah. It's the only comic I can actually like understand because I don't really do comics. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, so, you know, so we were practicing. And the thing that I was really, really into above anything else was astral projection. 
And what's that? That is um, the the belief that you can separate your soul from your body. So you can like literally lift yourself out of your body and watch yourself and travel around and go to places and things like that. So mm-hmm. I really wanted to do that. Sounds great. <laughs> you know, like I felt pretty trapped by my body. Yeah. You know, for reasons that you can imagine from yeah. what I said before. So one day, oh, I'll tell you this one thing about the control part. So because I was in art school, you know, I was drawing all the time and I would draw on the subway a lot. And I traveled with this pack of kids that all went to LaGuardia and we were up early in the morning You know, it was like a very kind of tight knit group. And so I was drawing uh, this dagger that was like a witch's dagger. It had like symbols on it and stuff. I'm sitting on the, the subway drawing that. And this kid comes over to me and goes, what are you drawing? Keep in mind, we're like 13, 14. Can mm-hmm. you imagine like your precious little kids? <laughs> right. And I looked up at him and I went, it's a witch's dagger. Like that. Uh-huh. Like I just so wanted to be like nobody was going to get anything over on me. Like yeah. nobody was going to like think I was, you know, naive or cute or vulnerable or yes. anything like that. Like I was in the driver's seat. And so I was going to tell you what this creepy thing was, you know. So fast forward. Okay. So I'm like 14, 15 and my parents uh, divorced my mom and my stepdad. Mm. So my mom and I moved up to the Upper West Side and we lived in a studio apartment that was about half the size of this room. (laughs) And she was seeing somebody. So she was never home. So essentially I was on my own from 15. I cooked for myself. I got myself going in the morning. I never saw my mom. I I think I saw her in the apartment twice in the whole time we lived there. So I would come home from school, which was five blocks away or whatever, walk home, promptly like get out my book on astral projection and I would lay down and I would try to separate from my body. This was like my after school activity, Mm -hmm. you know. And one day I felt like I was coming out and I could kind of like see with my eyes closed. I could, I was getting this sense that I could do that. And just as I felt like I was maybe like an inch or two above my body, the phone rang and it was my boyfriend. And he was like, hey, what's going on, you know? And I'm like, ah. <laughs> and I felt, I felt myself slam back into my body, like as if I was hit by a truck. And I started shaking, talking to him. And I'm like, ah, I can't really talk right now. Like my voice is trembling. And I started to notice my fingers turning black. Oh my. It was really freaky. So anyway, I hung up with him and just tried to calm myself down and stop shaking and whatever. And then I kind of got over it and went on my memory way. Never thought about it again. Except that I started having uncontrollable thoughts. Disgusting like gross, like pornographic, racist, like all these horrible thoughts. And it, and it was torturous. Mm -hmm. It was like all day, every day from the minute I woke up to the time I went to bed, all these thoughts, it was like a, it was like a four lane highway going like crossing my brain and I couldn't make it stop. Like nothing. I would try to be like, I don't think that way. Like this isn't even me. And it, it felt like somebody else was thinking thoughts into my brain. So I wonder, should I tell you the conclusion of this story now or because it it didn't resolve for quite a time later. Whatever you want. But did you share this with your 13 year old friend, the fellow witch? I don't think so. Yeah. What about the uh, coming out of your body thing? Because that seems like if I was practicing witchcraft and I found some quote unquote success in that area. Yeah. That would be something I would want to share and encourage for others if I thought it was a good thing. I might have shared it with her. I, yeah, I, I might have shared that with her, but I probably wouldn't have shared the like the thought. I, yeah. I didn't tell anybody about the yeah, thoughts. Sure. No, no, no. Did and you, I also didn't connect it. That's what I was going to ask. You didn't no. connect it with that experience. No, no, no. Um, so around that time, too, I made a friend who was a Hare Krishna. Uh-huh. <laughs> and um, so I started going to the Hare Krishna temple with her. Yeah. And dancing before idols and doing all this, uh, this crazy stuff and eating vegetarian food. And it was, it was a party. It yeah. was like a party all the time, dancing like crazy, you know, being 
like letting my hippiness really yeah. come to the fore, you know. Mm -hmm. So it kind of developed more, even more into this kind of syncretist um, set of practices and, and beliefs. Like, but the one thing that I took away from that time with the Hare Krishnas was that God was personal. Like, first of all, that there was such a thing as God, whatever they called him, and that he saw me. So, and that also, my my friend told a story about, um, she was like saying her prayers on her Hare Krishna beads or whatever, and um, she was in a van with a with a plate of food on her lap, and they hit a bump and the food went all over her, and she felt like God was laughing with her, mm -hmm. and she felt like God had a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And that really struck me like, oh, <clears throat> it kind of broke my brain a little bit. It was like, God is personal, he sees me, and he has a sense of humor. Like, he's not just a random being or deity out there in the universe. Like, he actually has personality. Mm -hmm. Did you so, continue to practice astro, 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 astral, projection. astral projection after that point? Like, when you were with the Hare Krishnas, did you continue to read yeah. witchcraft books and try? Yes. To, okay. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I was vegetarian from, like, a pretty young age. And, you know, so I was kind of on board with all of this mm -hmm. Um you know, these practices and things. And I, and I thought it's important to say, you know, the way that witchcraft is presented even now is that it's just light, you know, it's like you're shedding all the trappings of organized religion and man-made things and whatever. And you're just like, you're letting your spirit kind of be free and, and just kind of float around and, and do good for people. And, mm -hmm. um, you even hear this from like the, the Satanists now, like, yeah. um, like the, the thing that happened with Target, with a designer with Target, mm -hmm. who's a Satanist, but like doesn't really believe that Satan exists, but also believes that Satan is really for you and like is, is like all about love. And I'm yeah. like, okay. So with Wicca, it, Wicca itself is kind of like, a, it's a syncretist religion. It's not, it has trappings of ancientness, but it's not really, it's pretty modern. It, and it's kind of bringing all, it's like what I did like bringing all these kind of practices together and kind of making a religion out of it, you know? Um, but we would have definitely said that we were wielding light, mm -hmm. you know, for mm -hmm. sure. Like we didn't want to hurt anybody. We didn't believe in, we didn't believe in the devil. We didn't believe in demons. Maybe we believed in spirit beings or something like that or spirit guides, you know, but it was all very like, it was all very chill, man. Very chill. This you know? reminds me, I'm reading The Brothers again. So yeah. I'm going to become insufferable throughout this interview. No, I've been reading The Brothers talk. for like 10 years. It's okay. I love it. But um, when Father Zosima talks to the the holy women and one of them, he quotes a doctor he once knew who said, the more I love humanity, the, the, the less I love my neighbor. And that idea is whenever I hear yes. people being effusive about love and light, yeah. I wonder how they treat people who are closest yeah. to them. Well, I'm reading the um, biography of Mother Maria Skopstova. Okay. Do you know who she is? She was a Orthodox nun <clears throat> during uh, in Nazi occupied France. She said the same thing. She said, you, you can't love humanity. <clears throat> You know, if you, anyone that she's met that's, that loves humanity hates the individual. Absolutely. She probably got it from Dostoevsky. Actually. Yeah, and I see that in uh, certain political movements yeah. today, let's say. Certain uh, people who might riot and that sort of thing. Where they, yeah. There's a lot of talk of love and peace where there is no peace. Yeah, Absolutely. And a lot of talk of these kind of generic, um, a generic sense of love and a generic sense of uh, justice or helping the oppressed. But, the, but those people never have faces. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not about the individual sitting next to you because that person might be a Nazi. So, right, right. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah, it, it is very kind of anonymized and faceless. And um, I remember a university professor saying, uh, it's easy to love humanity because humanity never leaves their garbage can cans out too late. They don't play loud music. They don't right. They don't chew ice in front of you, which to <laughs> me is the worst offense. Oh, really? Okay, I'd be careful because I'm a big ice chewer. Worse than that is when people, I'm going to just <laughs> keep saying this until I shame everybody into stopping. When people sit in a quiet room and they allow their phone to bing, bing, yeah, bing, is that it? just says that because I do that and do he wants me to stop and I no, won't. That's not. No, you got to turn that sucker <laughs> I off. I basically man. refuse. It's not on during the show, <laughs> if, but like if we'll be was, sitting in. If there was somebody sitting across from me and they were chewing ice while their phone was binging and then I noticed they had a Disney castle tattoo. Oh dear. I don't think I could love them. 
Yeah, no. yeah. I would become like there. The, there are the things that test your the limits of your love. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. You did yeah. like somebody's phone went off in the cigar lounge like a week ago, and you went, "Are you going to turn that off?" It and it was like night. we weren't yeah. even. <laughs> I just feel like I'm going to embrace my grumpy old man at this point. No, I feel like I'm going to become uh, the least kind old lady. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, there's part of me that's like, Lord, I want to become more loving like you. You know, but, but then um, there are people who need discipline who didn't geez, get it. Yeah, my gosh. Listen, you but know, when. When I consider what my family have to put up with me, oh. I need to be more merciful to the bingers and the ice chewers. It's a, it's a pretty short path. <laughs> what, short, what do you mean? Short a path? pretty short path between like my judgmentalism yeah. and me realizing, oh no, oh, I'm, I'm the a-hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But okay. Um, loving, loving light. Yeah. Dispelling the darkness. Totally, just totally. Freedom, man. Yeah, it felt great. So, no. It is so attractive. Like I went mm -hmm. through a phase in my teenage years of new age tapes that I would listen to mm -hmm. uh, and meditation. And whenever even the most new agey new age tapes or books that I got referenced heaven and it wasn't the sort of Christian heaven, right. but just that Christian language turned me off completely. I would put it away. They didn't want oh, anything to do with it. Um, but I liked kind of this. And what is that? I think it's. I want there to be more to life. Yeah. I want there to be this hidden world that I've always suspected yeah. existed. I want to be special. I don't want demands placed upon me unless they're so general that I can't possibly break right. them. Well, essentially, right? You want to be your own God. Yeah. That's what any of us want in our sort of natural, untamed yeah. state. We want to just be our own God. The, yeah. so the God of our own heaven. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it becomes and, hell. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it, and it did. Yeah. Very quickly for me. So... Around that time, you know, I told you I was doing a lot of theater yeah. uh, at this Catholic church, actually. Mm. And I started playing guitar. Um, they did a, you know, folk mass and everything. And so, so sorry. That's this okay. is why you're Orthodox today. Well, listen, you know, <laughs> I still love those like, um, what is it? Gary Daigle. Is that his name? Uh, I don't know. I, it's like Catholic renewal folk yeah. stuff. Well, that's well, where I learned to play guitar. This man. was our tradition as well. Yeah. So even if it's not optimal. Or not even good. It's, yeah. You can't help but be sympathetic to things that you were raised with oh, that spoke yeah. to you at one point. You kind of see how. Like Creed. Things. <laughs> my own prison. Come on. <laughs> yeah. You, you kind of see how things um, are like mile markers along your path, yeah. you know? And it's, I don't know. I think I have less resentment toward those things in a way. Yeah. You know, I see how God was always. Um, trying to get my attention in the ways that I could hear at the time. Mm -hmm. Like I had a bus driver who used to share the gospel with me, like every time I got on the bus. And I, I was like, yeah, man, whatever. Couldn't hear it at the time. Yes, yes. I had a classmate whose mom would, would give her Bible verses in her lunch every day. And we would just make fun of her, like, yeah. you know, mock her mercilessly. Allison, I'm sorry if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, so those kinds of things I couldn't hear it's only in hindsight that I realize, oh, he was always trying to get my attention in these little ways, you know, and even if at the time it didn't work, now I see it, you know, that he cared. Yeah. You know, he was calling me. So these, these friends also went to this youth group. It was like an evangelical youth group. They were always inviting me. And I was like, I'm not going to your youth group. Like, I'm a witch. Like, <laughs> I don't think there's a place for me there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So for like, I didn't know this till much later, but for two years straight, they had a prayer group that would go up on the Bayonne Bridge on Tuesday nights and they would look out over the, what is it? The Arthur Kill. I don't know what that is in Staten Island that the Bayonne Bridge goes over. But, um, and they would pray for me mm. for two years because they decided to choose the most hopeless case <laughs> and see. Ouch. <laughs> well, yeah, they were like, okay, she's the longest shot. Yeah. If she can get saved, like, you know, mm -hmm. so they prayed for me for two years. And during that time, um, about, about a year into that, I would say, I, I agreed to go to the youth group and it was pretty fun. You know, like I could play the guitar. We, you know, we hung out, we played games. Like the youth leaders were amazing. They took us very seriously. They didn't patronize us. They mm. weren't trying to be our buddies. Good. They didn't wear like Hawaiian shirts and have goatees, like nothing like that. Oh. I look at him because he's always wearing Hawaiian Sorry. shirts. But Hawaiian shirts are the best shirts. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have a good team. Or a backward baseball cap. That's another thing I can't 
handle. The backward if baseball cap is over a child 15 thing. years old. Now you here's what's it. worse than the backwards baseball cap. Even worse than that is when people use that reflective sticker and they don't take that off. I will not. I will not stand for that. I, I can't no say what that, that is. I, I have think a huge you should have said that either. That. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I don't know. Or like, I don't, yeah. This is why I, I need Jesus, on on. all right? No, seriously. If people are like, you're the worst. I'm like, I know. Yeah, no, I'm totally. <laughs> Try even, being in me it's or me. It's way worse than it's you think way here. Worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I had these amazing youth leaders and uh, anything I could throw at them because I did, like anything they would say about the Bible or about God or whatever, I'd be like, um, have you ever thought that, you know, Jesus was married married to Mary Magdalene? Like, I just mm -hmm. read that in a book. You know, I was such a smart aleck, you know, mm -hmm. thought I knew everything. And they just, I don't know, they, they, they didn't say it outright, but they were probably thinking, bless your little heart, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Can, can we smack you upside the head now? Like, thank God for patient Christians. Oh huh? my gosh. They when were I best. went on my trip to Rome where I came to Christ or he mm -hmm. came to me, mm -hmm. I uh, was with a bunch of young Catholic teenagers. Yeah. And I remember just swearing, just trying to shock people. Yeah. I don't know what that was. I like oh, yeah. shocking people. I, I did that so much. I was like, where does that desire come from? It's, it's just control. a teenage, is it? Yeah. It's the ah. control. It's like, I like, I'm not going to let anybody push me around or dictate my reality. I'm, I'm on top. But I'm you know in what's weird is how, how does that couple with a desperate desire to be wanted and accepted? Because <laughs> that's what teenagers are, isn't it? Like, that's what I was. I wanted to shock you. I wanted mm -hmm. to be aggressive. But I deep down really yeah. wanted to be welcomed and accepted. I think it was like, yeah, because you, you want to know that whoever is, whoever you're trying to shock can handle it. You know, like, can yeah. you handle this? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if you can, all right, maybe I'll, maybe maybe I'll trust was. you, you know? But just to wrap up that story, the people on that plane with me and on that yeah, pilgrimage yeah. were very patient with me. Yeah. 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 Like your friends. Unbelievably patient with like my <laughs> preaching vegetarianism and like mm -hmm. all the, oh gosh, I, I look back on it and I just cringe. I'm like <laughs> 15, 16 year old me. Holy cow. Wow. So anyway, I was going to this youth group for about a year and- I think I would have really liked you. I think we would have been friends. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I've watched some interviews and I think, oh, man, yeah, I, I think was, we would have been friends in high school. I was, uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, okay. So I so this youth group had a real premium on, on, on memorizing scripture and then mm. learning the scriptures. They were so good at that. There was mm. nothing dumbed down about this group. It was amazing. And so one night we were going through um, Galatians 5. Okay. And they start reading the, the list of things according to the flesh, right? And it's like, you know, adultery, sexual immorality, but, and I'm just like, yada, yada, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden it said sorcery and witchcraft. And I was like, what? Like, I thought I could do both of these things. It says not to do that. And it like, it was the first kind of like interruption into this whole thing that I had built around myself, like this, this armor mm -hmm. of spirituality that I had built around myself. And it was like the first arrow that kind of pierced and made me go, oh crap. <laughs> I was gonna swear, but I'm trying, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get better. Mm, me too. Um, so I don't know, it kind of like went in and out, you know? Kept going for a few months and are you still having these compulsive thoughts? All the time, all the time. Yeah. But trying to kind of stuff them down and, and, and I was doing really great in school. Like I was finally f like finding myself as an artist and um, getting to know what I wanted to do with my life. And like from the outside, you would never have guessed that all this was going on inside. And at that time also like the abuse at home got really, really bad. Um, and I just, I never wanted to be home. Like the, the things that my, I, I, I want to be careful how I talk about my mom, obviously, but um, it, it was bad. Okay, the um, the the verbal and the um, sometimes physical abuse was was awful. So, but but I was putting on this. 
I was putting on these airs of respectability and of professionalism. And, I, you know, I was gigging by this time. I was already playing shows out. You mm. know, I was really, you know, living by myself, really kind of trying to put this forward. Um, by the way, when I say like going home or encountering my mom or whatever, it was kind of like even though they were separated, I was living in this apartment, but my siblings and my stepdad were still living in the house in Staten Island. And occasionally my mom would go back there and sleep or like occasionally we would find ourselves in the same environment, mm -hmm. never at the apartment, but sometimes at my stepdad's house. And that's where I would encounter, you know, a lot of this. So anyway, um, it's a Friday night. I'm 16. It's the end of my junior year. And I went to my friend's house and we were hanging out in his basement, in his room in the basement, and he tried to make a move on me. Now, the whole kind of scene of sexuality for me was was also very fraught because at that point, I didn't know about this whistleblowing that I had done as a three-year-old. I didn't remember the abuse at that point. I was just confused. I was all over the place. I didn't know if I was straight or gay. I didn't know like what I wanted to do or not do with guys or with girls. It, it was so confusing. Mm. And so when this guy, um, you know, it was the first time I had received like an overt um, solicitation. And it, it, it confused the heck out of me. I didn't know what to do because I had no reason to say no. And I didn't like him, but I also had no reason to say no. So... I remembered very conveniently that it was Friday and at seven o'clock there was going to be youth group. So I said, oh, I have a thing. I got to get to youth group. So I asked his mom to drive me. So we're driving over there, you know, and I get to the church. And the, the way the church was, was like youth group was in the basement and the sanctuary was up here. But the narthex was like had stairs and it was like a kind of nether region. right? Mm -hmm. It was like the in between, you know. So I just sat on the steps like I couldn't bring my I was so ashamed at that episode that had just happened and by my thoughts and all of this stuff. I was just in this state of like utter confusion. Um, is it Dostoevsky? Who says that uh, when you look into the abyss, the abyss looks back into you? Is it Nietzsche? It sounds like Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Sure. That was what it was like. I couldn't bring myself to go downstairs. I just sat on the steps and I started to sob my eyes out. Nobody was around. And I had this vision of the abyss. And I was looking straight into it. And it was like, on the outside, everything looked good. I was, you know, cool, funky artist in the 90s in New York. You know, like, very much aware of that kind of persona mm -hmm. of mine. And on the inside, it was just like annihilation. I had no reason to live or die. I had no reason to sleep with somebody or not sleep with somebody. I had no reason boys or girls didn't matter. Like I had no reason for anything in life. So I'm sitting there sobbing, looking over the abyss and one of the youth leaders comes up and sees me a mess. And he literally just sits down next to me and he just stays with me. He doesn't say a word. I must've sat there for half an hour I'm just bawling my eyes out. He's just letting me cry. And then finally he says, you know, people are going to start coming up here in a minute. Do you want to go in the sanctuary? So we go in there. Again, he just lets me cry and cry and cry. And finally he said four words to me. Do you want Jesus? <sighs> and it was like, Keep in mind, too, this is not the four spiritual laws. This is not catechism. This is not a sermon. This is do you want Jesus? And it was like everything in me like rushed together into this. I don't know. It was it just rushed together. And all of a sudden out of my mouth came. Yes. Whew. And as soon as I said yes, I, I had another vision. And I mean, I was there at the foot of the cross. And I was just at his feet. Like his feet were right here. It's all I could see, just his toes and the nail. And in the vision, I backed up 
and I had piles of paper and I just crumpled up these pieces of paper and I just like with all my rage and my fury, I just hurled them at his feet, just throwing them one after the other, just hurling them at his feet. And they would pile up and pile up and pile up and pile up until they hit his little pinky toe and then everything disappeared. And it was just his feet again. And I did that like two, three times. And then I heard the youth leader say to me, um, well, do you want to pray with me? And we said some prayer. I don't remember the prayer. But I, I knew that I knew that I knew that everything was different from that point on. Um, and I didn't know why, because I didn't know what had happened. I just knew that I met this person. So the next day, uh, we, we went to some amusement park or something. We're on the bus. And I said to my friends, I, I think I got like saved last night. <laughs> Like, I don't know what happened, but like this thing happened and they were all like, you know, rejoicing and happy. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, and I'm like, I don't know what happened. But that night when I went home from that youth group, um, he gave, he like handed me a Bible from the pew, you know, and was just like, go. friggin' love Protestants who love Jesus. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There, was, there was no intrusion. It was like, he let that moment be as holy as it needed to be. What you a know? beautiful healing too, because, you know, so many of us have heard stories of or experienced things where we were preyed upon in our yeah. vulnerable moments. And you've had that in your history yeah. to have a man sit by you and to not try to wound you, to try to take from you. Right. What a beautiful healing thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. I'm still in contact with him. Like, thank God. I for want him. his number just so I can tell him I love him. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> his, yeah. his name's Bert Crab. He's amazing. Bert? Bert. <laughs> Yeah. Right? No way. He's not 60s plus. Bert. He's not. He's not. He's not. No. Okay. He's like in Sorry, his 50s Bert. or something. Well, that's no. close. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I, so he handed me this pew Bible and he's like, go, go home and read this. I read that Bible all night. From where? I don't even. Like Genesis? Did like, you, where did you start? I think the Gospels. I probably yeah, read the idea. Gospels. Yeah. I didn't even know to. It was like, I just kind of opened it and sure. I like, I like fell head over heels in love with Jesus. I was like, oh my God, you were here this whole time? It was, yeah. And I'm telling you, like, it was not very long and it wasn't people telling me to do this or that or not do this or that. It was like, you don't need this anymore. Yeah. That's, that's over, that's done, that's done. I never looked back with the new age stuff. Like I, I just like wasn't interested anymore. Right. I just, I, it was Lost all its appeal. him. It was just all him. It wasn't even church or youth group culture or whatever. It was just him. It was him. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to close the loop now on the, um, on the astral projection story. So it's about a year later and I'm on a winter <laughs> retreat with the youth group. A what retreat? A winter retreat. Okay. So the speaker, you know, did his little talk and then he's like, if you want to stay behind in the chapel to pray, to, you know, blah, 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 go ahead. Chapel's yours. So at the time I was struggling with some uh, feelings of unforgiveness toward my stepdad, stepdad. So I was like, well, I'll stay here and pray for forgiveness for my stepdad. Yeah. I'm sitting there. It's kind of going nowhere. I'm like, oh, Lord, help me. <clears throat> help me forgive him. Uh. And the same youth leader comes over and he's like, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, well, actually, I'm, I'm here like praying for forgiveness. But the real problem is that I'm having these uncontrollable thoughts because they were still happening yeah. all the time. And he goes, um, by any chance, were you ever involved in witchcraft? <laughs> and I was like, damn it, Bert. <laughs> <laughs> you know me. Right. You know, and I was like, how did you know? He goes, why don't you let me pray for you? Mm. So he starts praying for me. I don't even know what he was praying. He wasn't like doing an exorcism or anything like yeah. that. All of a sudden I felt this being manifest and I just start screaming, get out of me, get out of me. And I felt like I was going to vomit. It was horrendous. And you know, he was praying for me. I was telling it to get out. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, quiet. And the thoughts were gone. <laughs> it was over. Wow. I was free. Totally free. Mm. Yeah. How did Bert react? I think he was happy. <laughs> <laughs> Go Bert. What a guy. Yeah. 
So then what happened? Oh my gosh. Well, even just that day, what happened? You just got up, left the church and yeah, experienced and I think, you know, just a like peace we went inside of your head. Or Yeah, it was like, never struggled with that again. Hmm. It's been 30 years. I just want to pause and say that um, in a day in a day like this, where truth feels so under assault, and the traditions that ought to be ours by right were robbed us, we can be um, maybe too well triumphalist in our Christian tradition. Yeah. And what I'm about to say isn't that. It's all the same, and right. whatever differences we yeah. have don't matter. But I think we forget that the Lord Jesus Christ is at work in yeah. all of these communities, and Absolutely. his name is power. Yeah. And he doesn't change even if the communities do. Mm. He's God. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and God. that's not, I'm not a, I'm not a, um, <clears throat> I'm not a syncretist, mm -hmm. you know, I am ecumenical mm -hmm. within Christianity. Um, and I would say I'm. But it's well, like, I think what I find so frustrating is yeah. I know that there would, there would be a version of me that would want to tell Bert to get it together and to just <laughs> finally realize this, that, or the other thing yeah, sure. that I as a Catholic believe. And yeah. all of that would have been, I think true. Yeah. And yet here he is calling on the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is liberating this lovely young girl, you know? The worst case, the hardest case. Yeah. Yeah, the long shot. The simpleton, the least qualified. <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, where do we go from here? Did you share your faith with your mom or are you not interacting with her at this point? I did share with them, uh, with my mom and my stepdad. Um, my stepdad was not happy. So like, even though I really had no relationship to Judaism at that time, I, f I think he felt a, a bit betrayed, you know, that he yeah. had tried to raise me Jewish and maybe it didn't take or something. But I, But really from the very first, you know, the very earliest days of, being a Christian, it clicked for me. Like when I would read the gospels, I'd be like, this is like so Jewish, like it's happening in Israel, like everybody's Jewish, uh, you know what I mean? It just made sense to me in a way that um, I would find, it, I would still feel a little bit alienated from my friends who, it seemed like they thought Jesus came from France or something mm -hmm. or like, you know, actually they were all, um, a lot of them were Norwegians. So like- <laughs> Norwegians? Yeah. Okay. Like Norwegian Jesus or yeah. something, you know, I'm like, yeah. oh, he wasn't Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. So. So how did your Christian life develop after that? Well, um, I was really, really influenced uh, also in high school by, um, I had a lot of friends who were black from the black church mm -hmm. and their kind of like charism and um, intimacy and friendship with the Lord, like made a really big impact on me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I felt like that was really uh, deeply part of me. Um, you know, so that was like high school and college were actually like that. You know, I was really, um, I would say I, I didn't go full time to a black church, but I felt very comfortable in black churches. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe because of the, of the music that I was used to, like we sang a lot of gospel in high school and, you know, that felt very familiar and comfortable to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I went to college for illustration. Uh, I did a very short stint one year in scene design for theater in North Carolina. And as a New Yorker going down to North Carolina, I was like, get me <laughs> back home. I can't do this. <laughs> it was too much culture shock, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it was still very segregated at the time in the, yeah. in the early 90s. So I didn't feel comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. But then I knew, like, I have to illustrate fairy tales. That's what I'm going to do with my life. So I transferred schools. I went to Parsons School of Design for illustration. Um, that's all I wanted to do. And I think, too, as an artist, I know like a lot of Christians have difficulty reconciling the arts with their faith. Mm. I think I've come to understand that this seems to be more of a Protestant problem 
because of the kind of icon iconoclastic mm. atmosphere. You know, having images in church would be too Catholic or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, mm -hmm. and we don't want we don't want to do that. You know, I encountered a lot of that, and I'm like, what? I I don't even understand what you're talking about. Like, it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like you guys like him too, right? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, these these kinds of things have not really always made a lot of sense to me. You know. Yeah. He's, how did you? I want to know how you became Orthodox. Oh, so that was only last year. Yeah. Yeah. So. So then, so and we, how long have you been married? Twenty five years. Oh golly. Yeah. Wow, I get the feeling that you're older than you look. You look young, but thank you. Twenty five, man. Thank you. I've been married seventeen years. Yeah. So it, did your did you marry your husband? Was he a Christian? Yeah. Like a Protestant practicing he, evangelical. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We met in college. Um, we were playing at the same music festival. We were both musicians and artists. And um, I kind of accidentally visited him at his college. I was going to visit his friend, mm -hmm. um, not in a romantic way or anything, but anyway, they were friends. And uh, quickly realized that he was a serious artist and also a Christian. And this confused me because I was the only <laughs> one that I knew that was like that. And I'm yeah. like, oh, at two per day. <laughs> um, that's not the right reference. He wasn't about to stab Caesar, but anyway. <laughs> so I, um, I I fell in love with him hard. Really? You know, like he good. he took me to his art studio and like showed me around. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're really good. You're mm. not just, you know, you're not making Jesus junk or like yeah. lions holding flaming swords or something like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, oh, God, God forgive me. I'm so Did he judgy. wear a, sh a shell necklace? Ever? He did not wear a shell necklace. Okay. Did he have bleach tips? Never. All right. No, he had a shaved head. Okay. Yeah. He had a shaved head and round glasses and a dirty white t-shirt. Nice. Yeah. He's the best. Okay. Yeah. And like copper bell bottoms. Okay. It's like exactly what you were after. Type, <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been married 25 years. We got married as soon as I graduated from college. Yeah. Have two kids. Okay. Yeah. Adults. Wow. Crazy. It is crazy. My son's in the Marines. Holy mackerel. How old are you? Do I say? I, I don't think know. I, I've never understood why this is an offensive question, but apparently the, the females find this offensive. I'm 46. Okay. I don't feel I, 46. Yeah. I think well, I um, thought you were definitely younger than that. That's the joy of the Lord, Matt. Praise it's God. It's the joy of the Lord. So did you and your husband have a, I mean, a faith based relationship have Ab you absolutely in yeah. fact okay so i uh, will just scroll back a little bit right yeah. so to this the subject of teenage sexuality right uh -huh. so all this confusion that i had you know um i dated a lot and um i never went all the way and i think part of it was that i knew that i had the trauma from my childhood and i just like did not want it at all Mm -hmm. Like I would have been, I, in fact, when he and I met, I was looking into a, in joining a lay order mm. and like possibly just being celibate, yeah. you know? Um, but I knew that I did not want to do uh, the whole dating scene. I didn't want to do that. I was like, I just, I want to meet somebody and get married. If I'm supposed to be married, I mean, uh, that'll be when I'm like 35, way down the mm. line, you know? And then when I met him and it was like, oh my gosh, it's him or nobody. Um, we just developed a friendship because I didn't think he had any feelings for me at all. Mm. And we just developed this really deep friendship that was about our faith and about living pure, living for the Lord. Um, I know people have a lot of things to say about purity culture, but for me, it was a godsend. Mm. Like the, um, the message that I didn't have to do anything was like, I don't have to do anything. I don't like have to give my body to somebody just for whatever. It, it was such a gift, you know? So when I met him and like, you know, we both wanted to wait till marriage and, and we did. And it was like, oh, relief. Praise God. Yeah. How did you journey to the Orthodox Church? Or am I moving okay. too quickly? So it was, uh, we we moved out of the city, um, the, you know, the New York area six years ago. And we thought we moved into like New England, little New England town. 
And we thought, oh, we'll just go to the local church. I, I don't care if it's Presbyterian. I don't care. You know, mm. I just want to be the, the lady that shows up with the coffee cake. Yes. And like, I'm there for 30 years. And all I care about is I hear the gospel. Like, I don't care. I don't want to hear any kind of weird stuff or new ideas or whatever. Because we had been part of a church for um, a dozen years where my husband was a pastor. And um, it kind of deteriorated very fast. And we we had to leave that church under quite a bit of duress. Um, we were actually excommunicated from that church mm. um, because things got very culty. Mm. And so I didn't want church to be complicated in any way. You know, I didn't want to go along with the whims of the pastor or the latest personality. Like I've never really had much to do with Christian culture in that way. I don't really read Christian books, mm -hmm. you know, like popular books or any, I don't know who the authors of note are or the musician. I don't listen to Christian music, <laughs> I'm, st you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I just was not very familiar with that culture. And I thought the, le the less church culture I can have yeah. in that way, the better. I'll just bring the coffee cake, mm -hmm. light a candle. That's it, mm -hmm. you know. So for three years or so, we were going everywhere we could, <clears throat> trying everything, and everything felt like a performance. And it felt like they were putting on a show for the people that were not sitting in the room. It was like all this wishful thinking for who they would prefer to be there, oh. except the people who were oh, actually there. Oh, <laughs> I get that. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And, you know, our kids were teenagers at the time and they weren't having it. They didn't like the youth group scene. And I'm like, this isn't like my youth group. Yeah. This is so fake. Like, oh my gosh. So I was researching for one of my books, A Cloud of Outrageous Blue, and I needed some like medieval research. And um, I had just started talking to Jonathan Pajot at the time. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned orthodoxy. He mentioned the OCA, the Orthodox Church in America. And I thought, that sounds kind of like medieval. I bet I could get some research done there. So I you know, Googled a church in my area. I found one 15 minutes away. We went to visit, we went to a divine liturgy. Mm. And the priest took us, uh, uh, you know, made a separate appointment with me and took me around the whole church, showed me everything, every icon, answered all my questions. And I got great research for the book, right? Mm. And then COVID hit. And my kids anyway were like, not really able to stand for two hours during the divine liturgy, you know, they were a little too young for that. Mm -hmm. So COVID hits, we do the whole jammy church thing, oh, you know, yeah. online jammy church yeah. with, with your hot mug of coffee. <laughs> and I was dying. I was like, I can't, this is not yeah. church. I need community. I need people, you know, and the, the culture in our town was not very social. I'm like, I'm like an extrovert. I'm like dying on the vine here. So finally I, I told Ben, um, listen, I'm just going to start going to Vespers. At that, at that cool little Orthodox church over there. Mm -hmm. And I'll just like get filled up. And then wherever we go on Sunday morning is fine. It's irrelevant. Well, I kept going. He started coming with me. And finally we, we thought, let's just try another divine liturgy. So the kids came back with us and it was like instant. It clicked. Mm. It just clicked for all of us. And I think what we really loved about it was this feeling like none of it was there to cater to us at all. <laughs> this isn't about you. It's not about us. There were no screens. There were no colored lights. There was no- Hot cups of coffee. I mean, there was a smoke machine, you know. <laughs> sure, <laughs> old school. Father Tom Soroka told me that joke like yesterday, it. so yeah. I'm using it. Um, and yeah, it just felt like the, it felt like it fit somehow. It felt like, oh, this is what's going on around the throne mm -hmm. for eternity. Mm -hmm. And we just get the privilege to step into it mm -hmm. every Sunday and participate in what's already going on. It was wonderful, you know? Um, Martin Shaw calls it, uh, do, you, do you know about Martin Shaw? He's an English storyteller. Yeah. He just became Orthodox and he says okay. the first time he stepped into a divine liturgy, it felt like he was stepping into a Christian dream. Mm, that's good. You know, and like other people have called it like a living fairy tale, like the, mm. you know, the fairy tale that's true that I think C.S. Lewis, you mm -hmm. know, says that about the gospel and you know mm -hmm. myth the myth that is true thank you yep. thank you same thing so yeah so it just fits somehow and um i think we went through catechism for about a year and were chrismated last fall beautiful yeah so well that's beautiful let's let's take a pause and yeah. come back okay thank you
any sinner is capable of being a great saint. And any saint is also capable of being a great sinner, a great sinner. Hi, everybody. I want to tell you about two of our sponsors that I want you to check out. The one is Emmaus Academy, which is part of the St. Paul Center, which Scott Hahn runs. And they've just created this uh, new digital learning platform. And it's really quite cool. I know and you know what it's like just to waste. How many hours a week do you think? Just sort of ferreting around on YouTube and Hulu or whatever else, looking at things that you probably is doing no edification. It's not even restoring you in a kind of natural way. But this Emmaus Academy has a lineup of really amazing teachers who teach scripture. So if you want to want to love scripture, you try and you feel bad because you know you should like it more than you currently do. Not that it's all about feelings, of course. But please check out stpaulcenter.com slash Matt. Click the link in the description below. When you sign up over there, you'll get two weeks for free, and that's access to all of these amazing courses that they've put together. And these courses aren't just Scott Hahn sitting in front of a laptop top lid to just chatting to a bad camera. It's actually really, really highly produced stuff. Um, John Bergsman we had on the other day, they talk about the Gospels. They took, they have my spiritual father, Father Boniface Hicks, talking about prayer. It's really quite amazing. So if you want to grow in the faith and in your love of Scripture, St. Paul, stpaulcenter.com slash Matt. Click the link in the description and, and check them out. I also want to say thank you to Hallow. You tell me about Hallow since you use it. Oh, my. You do the ad for me. <laughs> I'll pay you later. <laughs> I don't know. Well, Hallow is a great app that helps you to... Uh, stay consistent with prayer have on a daily it? basis. I have really enjoyed it. Ah, I it's really so have. good. I was listening to it this morning. They now have these new daily exegesis from the daily readings. Mm. So I was listening to that today. Um, it's really beautiful. Uh, the other night I played a sleep story to my son. There is just so much on it and it's so well produced. I think it's the greatest app I've ever oh. used. Mm. Maybe Delta is better. I don't know. But like maybe Delta? not. Delta? What's Delta? Delta's got a great app. I like the Delta app. Uber is probably a good app, but this <laughs> probably is the best app. The fellow who started this used to be into Buddhism and, and things like that. And he, there was a, a mindfulness app um, yeah. started by a Buddhist and, and he was into that. And, he, and when he became a Catholic, he's like, we should start something for Catholics to help them pray and meditate. Yeah, It's really good. If you go to hallow.com slash Matt, click the link in the description. You can try it for free for three months. It's awesome. And I, 90 days. I did try it free for three months, and then I kept my subscription because it was so good. It's Yeah, it yeah. is true. Hollow.com slash Matt. And I'm it. not going to tell you what any of the competitors' codes are. Yeah, yeah. Um, no. And if you sign up, if you sign up on the app, it's more expensive, 
and Apple gets a cut. That's why we're saying go to hallow.com slash Matt. Sign up there. Look, here, I'm going to give you a total out here. On your calendar, set a reminder for two months that tells you to cancel that app. Not three months because then you'll forget and then Two months in a charged. day, then you cancel it and you get the... you. The next you cancel it before the next charge and oh, you still get right. the three they months yeah stay big yeah. brain you're welcome do it but i don't think you will i think you'll use it and you're like this is really great and then you'll want to support this amazing group of people who are doing good stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. i sent you a slack by the way you sent me a slack uh oh okay sweet and Praise while God. Matt checks that, uh, if you guys send super chats, we'll try to get a mast, but no guarantees on but super we want to chats get, yeah. because we give pro priority to locals. Also, can we make an announcement about this local stream that you're doing for me tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so tomorrow at noon, we will be live streaming um, and it will be only it'll be an unlit. The, the link will locals, be yeah. only shared to locals, but it's not a local supporter stream. We'll also be having it for people who are signed up to our locals for free. So if you uh, are not yet signed up to the locals, even as a free member, go to mattfrad.locals.com and sign up. Tomorrow at noon, um, Melanie, the business manager, and Matt and I's boss. Yeah, let's be honest. Yeah, she's our boss. She's um, the greatest person ever. Have put together a birthday surprise for Matt, and That's we'll why be I look streaming confused. it. I don't know what's happening. I don't know. Yeah, Thank Matt you. has no Sunday. idea what's going um, on. So if yeah. you want to experience Matt's surprise at the surprise, <laughs> along with it's Matt, based, it's going to be Thursday jumping out of a cake naked. <laughs> <laughs> It's not that. It's <laughs> can't not that. You can't see that. <laughs> Speaking about compulsive thoughts, oh my I just gave it's that to Brett Cooper. All right. Anyway, Never so Never mind. Cool. Move on. Yeah. Go yeah. back to the show. We're done. We're right. done. Hey, We're I, would it be okay if we took questions yeah. from our supporters? I love these people Absolutely. and I don't want to give them the shaft like last time we had Dr. Bergs were on. We didn't <laughs> ask a single question. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't. Oh, um, really? Yeah, because he had to go. We're uh, going to have him back on real soon, though. He was amazing. So try. I, I know you might feel like you're doing some sort of uh, injustice to the questioner by giving a short answer, but try to give a short answer because okay. we have so many questions, okay. if that's okay. Sure. Tony okay. RVA says, what would you say to a curious teenager who is dabbling in Wicca to think it, and thinks it's harmless? It's not harmless. You let demons in. <laughs> I'm just joking. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. Sorry. Yeah, you're playing with demons. Like, yeah. I mean, everybody who's come out of Wicca will tell you, I didn't realize what I was playing with. Satan masquerades as an angel of light, and he really, really does. Mm. So don't think that for you it's going to be different. But if someone had said that to you when you were into Wicca, that probably wouldn't have helped. Uh, nobody did say that to me. Mm. They yeah. could have given you the choice. It's kind of like... You know, what could you say to a teenager who wants to have sex before marriage? You could at least say, don't do it. You could at least say. No one say, said that to me. You could at yeah. least say, there's another way. Mm. There's an alternative path. This leads to this. This leads to that. You know what you could do is you could have them listen to this show, Tony. Oh, yeah, you could. Do that. And we'll be doing some clips that are specifically on this topic. So check that yeah. out. Sometimes somebody. I got notes. It, you know how like the universal is told in the particulars, you know? Yes. So. Sometimes you can tell somebody like universal truths or whatever, but unless you hear somebody telling their own story, it's just going to be kind of meaningless sometimes. Yeah. Kyle Whittington says it's very easy for someone to feel like they're too far gone to ever approach a faith like Catholicism or holy orthodoxy. What does that path to Christ look like for someone who went off the deep end? I mean, the prodigal of the par the parable yeah. of the prodigal son. Yeah. I mean, nobody is too far. Look at Paul, you know, he was Ooh. complicit in murder. Yeah. He stood by holding the, the coats of people. You know what I mean? It's I like, know what you mean. Um, you know, I write about the Holocaust, mm -hmm. you know, and so a, a, a lot of what I'm interested in is um, the people who may not have um, pulled the trigger, so to speak, or put the Zyklon B gas in the, you know, in the shoot, right? But the ordinary people who just kind of stood by and did nothing and were complicit in murder. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? God can God can heal anybody and, and bring them to him. This is a nice point. Can you just quickly tell us about some of your books? Oh, sure. And, and, and so I said this to you in the car, I think, or when we were walking over, I forget when I said it. I was on the phone with you, I think. Yeah. You sent me a book that you had written. Now, people send me lots of things all the time. I just, they, I don't even know how they get our address. It just shows up at the studio. And, and I, sometimes I look at it and I think, this is great, like good for them. But I, I don't think this is actually amazing. Your book was like that. And I don't know if you brought any of those books. Like what? My book was... 
The book you wrote about the two brothers. Like bless on, your heart. No, okay. on, no, no, no. On both sides of the uh, the, uh, uh, the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall. I, I mean, I didn't. I have only read like three or four chapters. Mm-hmm. I've got to be honest. But mm-hmm. I was shocked at how good it was. Um, did you bring any of your books with you? I did. Can you please sign one book for my daughter Avila when you meet her will. and give it to yes. her? Yes. No, I have. I have. I want to shame kids. her into read good yeah. books because these books are for not just for adults. But so s- I write for young adult. I write young adult historical fiction. Yeah. Um, but I've been an illustrator for. 30 years or so. And, um, and, and so, just so people know, we have a link to her books, yes. to Vespa's books in the l- description to her. And they're really, really, really good. Like I'm so honored to have you on the show. Thank the you. Video. It's so funny because usually when I'm doing an interview, it's about my books. Yeah. And we have, we're only now starting yeah. to talk about what I actually do in life. who writes very poor fiction, <laughs> I know what good fiction looks like. It's well, like I didn't the, start writing till I was um, 35. Okay. Yeah. I was just an illustrator and a, and a songwriter. Mm. You know, I journaled a lot. I, wrote a lot of poetry, bad poetry and you know, some mm. good poetry yeah. and songs. But I, you know, I'm on a real journey with the Lord, man. Who knows where it'll end up? <laughs> Who knows? Jason of old says, I came out of Norse paganism and struggled off and on for 11 years with a desire to go back to the gods, even though I know they are demons. Do you have that struggle? And if so, what do you do? Any particular devotions that help? Hmm. Oh, that's such a good question. So I'm not, because I had such a personal encounter with Jesus, um, I'm not really tempted to go back to that stuff because it just feels so hollow to me now. Um, I I figure like all the riches are in him Mm. and like I can only ever eternally get closer and discover more about who he is. so I do, I do feel quite devoted to, um, now I don't know how theologically I, this sounds, but I'm, I'm quite devoted to the wound in his side. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like that is where I live. Mm. Um, and Mother Maria uh, Skubstova talks about this too, just like, um, you know, just being in the wound, like being in the wound of the world, basically. Mm. And I do feel that because of my story, I always live there. I live in the wound, but in such a, a deep joy in him, like that is unshakable. I, I feel tucked right up there by his heart, like tucked <sighs> right there. Like it's hard to No, I describe. know what you mean because I live in the womb of Mary. Uh, I'm constantly just hanging out there. Yeah. It's so weird <laughs> to people who don't know that kind of language. Yeah, it's like we're gonna lose we're gonna lose viewers real quick yeah. with this stuff. No, I'm kidding. But but I mean if you think about the sacred heart like that's what i'm talking about i'm i'm like tucked up there yeah. you know where it's safe and nothing can hurt me and and it's also where worlds are created and creativity comes from and mm. and joy is there and like so this is this is I mean? your devotion this is the, in response to this fellow's question that's the devotion yeah. um sometimes i am tempted to to say like, well, that certain practice, like what's so wrong with that? Like, can't I, okay, so like my massage therapist um, suggested that I get a certain crystal to deal with my stress, right? Mm -hmm. And like for many months, I was like, should I go get that crystal? Should I, because there's like a crystal shop in my town, like, Mm -hmm. should I go? And I'd pass it all the time and be like, oh, what's the harm, what's the harm? But then something in me just always checks it and goes, there's nothing for you there. That's good. It's, It's an inert rock. You know, there's nothing for you, you know, yeah. like go take a walk in the woods. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe to this point more, Tony asks, what are your thoughts on yoga? If any, mm. do you have any, no, no pressure to have a bunch of thoughts on yoga? I don't have a lot of thoughts on it. I did practice it for quite a while. Um, I have friends who teach holy yoga and whatever. I, I don't know. Um, I don't feel a conviction about it one way or the other. I think because I was in the Hare Krishna movement, I do feel a bit triggered by stuff like that. And I just like kind of don't want to go back there. Mm. But also um, I had a car accident 10 years ago that precludes me from doing stuff like yoga, really. Okay. So I don't I know, this may be an unsatisfactory I want to let people know I interviewed a fellow called um, Alex Frank already in the description you're the man oh, good. who's a former yogi and yeah. actually let people who have a conviction about it yeah. answer that question that you could, it was a two hour and 30 he's minute he's got chat. some great 
facts in there that people don't know that I people should. Yes. Yeah, if, you're, I, if you're someone who's like, every time someone's tried to tell me why yoga is wrong, I've never been convinced, that was me. Right. I was like, come on, just calm down. Like, not everything has to be evil. Yeah. Um, but he actually had a really nuanced take on it that I thought. I would say, good. like, the people that I have listened to that are against yoga, I completely see what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ethan R. says, you spoke a good bit on fantasy stories and fairy tales. What's your take on the idea that things like D&D and Harry Potter or other fantasy stories are demonic? Do you think fantasy as a genre is something Christians need to avoid? Where are those lines? Um, I don't think it's something you need to avoid as a right. genre. Mm, yeah. I, that would be throwing a lot of babies out with a lot of bathwater. Yeah, including Tolkien. Right. right. And, yeah. Um, and Nicholas Kotar, mm -hmm. who's a fantasy writer. Um because I don't read a lot of it now, I would say somebody like Nikki would be more articulate on this point. Mm -hmm. But I would say um, Harry Potter always felt funky to me, to be honest. And I didn't let my kids read it. And I would tell them why I didn't want them to read it. My daughter did wind up reading it in like early high school or middle school because we had talked about it and because I told her what things to look out for. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, um, and we, we, did it in conversation with each other and even read it together. So yeah, stuff like that. Um, I don't know. You, with all my books too, I feel like I trust the parent to, and this is a, this is a big thing with me is like, I don't, <laughs> I write with parents in mind. I write with the whole family in mind. Mm. So I'm not trying to like do an end run around that to kind of like get kids into whatever it is that I'm into. Yeah. I, I'm not into that. Um, Christian Mador says, oh, <laughs> I'll be watching what time? So that's not a question. Um, okay. Grady says, as a fellow ginger, what's your favorite ginger joke? Oh, gosh. Is uh, it? I, Do don't, have, I don't I know don't know any ginger know. jokes. Yeah, all right. He should have shared his. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, Paul Lahoud. Lahoud? Lahoud. He does our time stamps for us. He's the best. We love you, Paul. We love you, Paul. I haven't offered to pay him. And he's like, no. He just offers this Sweet. amazing service for us. He's a genius, And for too. everybody. Unironically, he's like, he? actually... Yeah, not it, like when you say I'm a genius. No, no like he's, he's got a full ride to, to his college, so... He's, what a guy. He's a genius, yeah. If you speak with... If you could speak with any saint from the first century, who would it be? Why them? And what would you discuss? From the first century? Like, <laughs> yeah. the apostles? I or the, well, You can't my, go past the Blessed Mother, can I you? mean, my gosh. Like, my patron saint <laughs> is St. Philip, the apostle. Okay. And... He's been following me around for a long time, since way before I was Orthodox. So I would definitely, I, I mean, I do like have conversations with him like, okay, teach me how to like do the come and see thing, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, yeah. like make me better at that, you know, pray to the Lord that I would like mm. have those kinds of, well, I might not have the answer, but like, come and see Like, I'll point you to somebody who does, you know, mm -hmm. like, let me introduce you to somebody, you know, and, uh, you know, just like with the gospel, like I, I want to be somebody who do, isn't just like, let me tell you how it's done, but just like, come, come in where I am. Like, it's mm. really nice in here. Mm. You know, there's like a lot of joy. Bert, like Bert. <laughs> yeah. Um, Maya says, I had similar interests in my youth because of which I have collected a number of books and objects that I had to destroy after my conversion. Some are still in my parents' house waiting for me snatch them did you have a collection yourself and what happened to those items sure did honey child i sure did and i burned them all <laughs> i burned everything i i burned or tossed everything like all my books i had a nice little bonfire in my garage which wasn't the best idea maybe <laughs> um like but a better idea than keeping them you know yeah even like um i was really into led zeppelin at the time mm -hmm. and I couldn't listen to, I mean, I can now, mm -hmm. um, love Led Zeppelin, but at the time there was music I couldn't listen to. I couldn't eat Indian food for a long time. That would kind of bring stuff back. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say if you have a funny feeling about it or you know it's connect, get rid of it and don't give it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Like pray over it, renounce any connection to it and just, and just to be clear for those watching you're, you're not making you're not saying like 
my crystals or let's say a Ouija board is on par with Indian food. So for the, I know no, you, no, what no, you no, I no. know what you mean, but just maybe explicate that. Yeah, no, yeah. of course right. I'm not saying you shouldn't <laughs> eat Indian food. I love Indian food. I hate Indian people. Oh God, this took no, a bad turn. No. <laughs> yeah. no. My husband's actually about to go to India for the eleventh time oh. next uh next week. But the point was just that during this phase in your life, these were things that you were engaging. Yeah, it's like when you know that you were engaged in something and had attachments to like dark spiritual things, like you should break those attachments. Yeah. Oh, to be fair though, Indian food is one of the greatest foods on earth. Oh, absolutely. I love it now. Bread. Is it tiki masala? Is that what they call it? Tikka yeah. masala. Tikka masala. Thank you. Somebody asked a good question. Go Can I ask it? it? They didn't yeah. super chat or anything, but I like the question. So, uh, okay. Can you talk about why relics are different than crystals? I could see a Protestant yes, misunderstanding a and thinking they're the same thing. Yes, and as a former Protestant, is that something you had to... Hmm. Wow. See, I'm not schooled and I'm still a noob, okay, with yeah. the whole Orthodox thing. Um, well, at the very least, you would say, you would point to a couple of verses in sacred scripture, right? Like... Peter's shadow or Paul's handkerchief. Exactly. Or, that, or the yeah. fringes of, of, of Jesus' Christ. garment, exactly. the tzitzit off his yeah. garment. Yeah. Um, that had a connection. So I would want to say to the person, explain those to me. Like, what was it about right. that? Because whatever your answer is, that's very different to an inert rock, like you said earlier. You don't like that? I, I, yeah. I mean, I see where that person's coming from, but... I think the difference is the spirit. <laughs> like one is connected to the devil and one is connected to the Lord. One's I mean, real. I want, yeah. I don't know. Also, I think there's something beautiful about being a humble son and daughter of the church. Yeah. You're like, because the church told me that's why I do it. Because Christians from in all centuries have given yeah. reverence to relics. Oh, I want to answer it this way. Okay. Um, Cause I did want to talk to you about relics actually, mm. because I did the Scavi tour. We have St. Thomas Aquinas in that reliquary there. That's pretty cool. Not all of Thomas yes. Aquinas, but just a small a little, chip. A little bit. Bigger on the inside. Um, yeah, and we, we have <laughs> relics of St. Nectarios in our church, and mm -hmm. um, we had a piece of the True Cross for a while. Mm. Um, so Ben and I went to Rome in November, like partly because I hadn't had a vacation in forever, um, but partly because as we were newly Orthodox and we were visiting our friend over there, um, I thought, oh gosh, like I've been to Rome a bunch of times, but I've never looked at the ancient roots of our faith. So here's a perfect opportunity. So I know you're supposed to book the Scavi tour like months in advance. I didn't, I didn't either. And I got in. I got in too. Wasn't it amazing? Oh my gosh. Uh, like, I loved it so much. I was like, um, I heard we could see the bones of Peter. <laughs> and they're like, talk to the Swiss guards. And like, I used my, the best of my Italian, which is very rusty. And at, at long last, you know, the guy was like, come back at 1.30, you know? <laughs> so it was great. And we had such an experience there. By the time you get to the end and you actually see his bones, I was like- I was in tears, yeah. I think this is what, what relics do for me. They go, they make me say, this is all real. Yeah. Like it's not in the realm of theory or anything like that, you know? Yeah. Um. So after we came back, we saw Paul's chains. We, you know, we were at his tomb and St. Paul outside the walls. Like we saw the chains that he had but while well, he was under uh -huh. house arrest and yep. everything. And I think it was after I came home from that, that you had the gentleman on who talked about the shroud. Mm -hmm. I'm Wasn't a, that incredible? I, I'm a believer. Yeah. Um, because for me, it's not just like, oh, look at this cool object. It's like, oh, the resurrection is real. Like, yeah. you know, and there's no other way to explain this object. So, I don't know. Uh, so anyway, I went to um, Israel in uh, May and that was another thing that was just like, it just hit me again and again. Like this is all, I've been walking with the Lord for 30 years, Yeah, you know? And it's kind of like the, the way that I feel about it is that just like Jesus began his ministry at 30, I'm at 30 years now hmm. and there's like more ahead for me. You know, mm -hmm. there's like an adventure, a new adventure that he's calling me on and relics feel like part of that. Mm. Just the tangible reality of our faith. And so when I was in Israel, I got 
the uh, mm. icon made without hands mm -hmm. tattooed on me, just to remind me, like, no, this is real, and I was I was there, like I walked. Yeah, I want to give a places. shout out to that interview with Father Andrew Dalton, which has almost got yes. a million views right now, Goodness. and for good reason. If you have uh -huh. not watched that, do yourself a favor, right? Yeah, that and the Eucharistic miracles. Oh, by the mm -hmm. way, I am also type AB blood. Mm. So I just, it's just all these things that feel like little tokens from the Lord. The yeah. like, no, you're really with me. Like, mm. I, you know, you're mine. You belong to me. So that's my long answer about relics. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. Back to the first question, what does she say to someone who would say that it only affects the person dabbling in it, so why does it matter? What does that mean? The it only Why does it matter if somebody's dabbling in witchcraft, in witchcraft? If it only affects them? Because you don't know what that person is calling on on your behalf either. You know, like when I was in it, I was uh, definitely trying to cast spells on other people. Was I telling them that I was casting spells on them? No. Yeah. You know, I don't know what damage I did then, but also I was a terrible person to the people around me. Like I was, I was horrible. Mm -hmm. I was just angry and bitter and confused. Yeah. You know, I wasn't a good person. I was dealing with real darkness, you know, and that, that definitely bled onto other people. So. That's just me. Patrick says, did Vespa experience any spiritual attack other than the intrusive thoughts during her conversion? If so, what kind? Did she notice a difference in spiritual attacks after being confirmed in the church? I mean, spiritual attacks now feel very external. They feel like something coming at me rather than something that's inside. You know, and so I can, you know, raise the shield of faith and be yeah. like, pew, pew. Like, not today. <laughs> Thank you. Kirsten says, I always live in super old houses, currently 180 years old house, and often feel like there are spirits around, but they don't feel mal maleficent. I actually feel comforted by them, especially when I'm saying my rosary. Should I not be okay with this? Hmm. You're on your own here. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I don't really, I feel like uh, you should talk to an exorcist about that. Yep. Good answer. Yeah. And we've had a couple of interviews with exorcists on the show, so you can yeah. look them up too. I live in a house that's 240 years old. Mm, you win. Um, I don't feel any presences there except the Lord. Tim Paul, probably not the Tim Paul. Tim Paul says, how ought contemporary Orthodox slash Catholic art look, sound, feel? Wow. Such a complicated question. I feel like I'd have to see that visually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than informing the culture... As in the medieval times and the Renaissance, the church now has to resist a culture with artistic expression, which seems like an exciting spot to be in and a call to answer. But I have yet to find something that does that as well as it maybe should. So I think what he's saying is like, what should contemporary good Christian art look like? Mm. Okay. This is something that I've been having conversations about for 30 years that often devolves into just like mush okay let's see and i it feels like an artificial separation for me um i don't make christian art but all of the art that i make is informed by my christian understanding of the world that includes human nature it includes psychology it includes mass movements of totalitarianism and how people act under duress and how people act when they're gripped with fear and how how a society acts when they're gripped with fear right mm -hmm. so like is that not christian art of course not it's it's informed by by that understanding you know of how of of how humans are right but also what is available to us in a redemptive capacity does that make sense I think so. Yeah. So um, I I kind of want to show what it looks like when when one character heads toward toward a path of redemption and when one character heads toward destruction. Like there's nothing wrong with showing that. Mm -hmm. We need to know those things, right? Yeah. As far as what kind of art comes into the church, I'm not really a fan of churches like setting up art galleries okay. and things like that. I feel like the, the church is a sacred space oh, that's sure. meant for art that is devotional and liturgical and meant to bring the people toward 
worship because that's what the place is for. You know, I, I'm not into like mixed um, mixed use buildings. <laughs> they feel yeah. like if it's everything, then it's nothing. But would you be okay with there being a Christian art show off a church premises somewhere? Uh, sure, but sure. what does that even mean, Christian art show? Are know. we talking lions with flaming swords? No. <laughs> and why don't you like <laughs> that, that? Because that shouldn't exist. Yeah, but why? Um, well, because it's it's kitsch and campy and and. What makes it's, something kitchen campy? I'm not trying to drill you. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just because I'm, I'm with you, but I don't know how to explain it. It's kind of like you know when you see it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Let like, me show you what I mean. I I was yeah. in Africa, Uganda, preaching, and I, I realized that there was this noticeable lack of both sarcasm and cynicism, Ooh. and also, um, I mean, this is my narrow experience, you might yeah. say, but it was mine, and I think it was real. Also, there was a, a lack. There was no cheesy radar and I, i've often thought that maybe sarcasm cynicism and finding things cheesy somehow goes together huh um I can see, yeah and so i'm wondering yeah like what is it is it something in us that needs to be healed so that we no longer see it as I or think, is it something embedded in the object that is by its very nature something that shouldn't exist you know i, I mean know. i think that a lot of the difficulties that we have with art are very modern problems because if you look you know before you know i don't know 1800 or something like that like most art was public like in the churches mm. or it was um in the palaces you know there was very little like commercial art mm. you know like maybe when newspapers and pamphlets and tracts started to get published or something like you started to okay. kind of blur the lines and get into more like popular art but that didn't really kind of exist before then like the yeah. art that people were encountering was not from something that was advertised to them like that's a very modern thing right yeah um the art that most people would encounter would be in church mm -hmm. so now when you have um like the appeal to the individual and or to the demographic or whatever, and you have uh, all of these objects and then it, it just starts to get all confused and muddy, you know? So I, I think that there's a movement among artists um, back toward traditional ways of, you know, it's getting less abstract. Like people are like gravitating more toward figurative art, mm. you know, more toward traditional stuff um, that's less confusing. And I don't know, I'm, value neutral on that you know my husband's an abstract expressionist painter okay right so and i and i love his work and i i love a lot of modern painting but it's all kind of muddied up there with like the commercial stuff do you know what i mean yeah interesting so then does it have maybe more to do with the avenue through which art is being pushed like maybe that's the thing that's kind of poisoning this art more so than the art itself does that make sense like you talked about pamphlets and it being targeted to a demographic or an individual. Yeah. Is it that kind of process that's maybe. Just creating a lot of junk. Yeah. And it's really hard to sort through it's the junk. It's also a lot easier to make art today than it well, was. Well, with AI, yeah. Well, that, that's but a I whole mean. Other... Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. I have an interesting art question. Can I ask it? Yeah, yeah. please. Okay, what is your favorite artist? Sorry, I know I can't see you, but I'm looking at you on screen. Okay. <laughs> the computer screen's in the way. Um. What's your favorite artist in each of the major mediums? Like painting, uh, sculpting, drawing, like in those oh, like that. major yeah. mediums. I'm like, how how granular do you want to get about mediums? Do you want to talk about watercolor, oil, acrylics? Whatever wash, you want. Like, <laughs> talk about, talk, the, the show is best when people talk about oh, yeah, what yeah, they yeah. love and know about. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give a shout out to my favorite illustrator, who's also my dear friend, Felicita Sala. Um, Can't spell she's, that. You know so, that she is a great artist, but Bert probably wasn't. I don't know that Bert ever did it. Yeah, you know, like just with a name like Felici. <laughs> Felicita. <laughs> Felicita. She's my friend in Rome. Bert. Yeah. Bert. Um, everybody should buy Felicita's books. And she's also an Aussie. So, she, yeah. Does she live there still? No, she's in Rome. Yeah, of course yeah. she is. Yeah. Do you have strong opinions on painters or like he said, like. Um, um, yeah, I have. I have favorite. They're mostly illustrators. I don't. Oh gosh, I saw yeah. a I saw a painting recently. I'm not going to remember it, so I shouldn't have brought it up. It just came out of my mouth. Often, I find my experience is looking at art that other people tell me is amazing, mm -hmm. and I I'm jealous that they find it that amazing, see, but yeah. I can't seem to. Right. I think that you just kind of like 
But there was this one that was a medieval painting that I saw that absolutely blew me away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think people I just it. like what they like and that's okay. Yeah. How, where's that line? Like, because a lot of us just ha- haven't been cultured, as it were, or haven't mm-hmm. been shown beautiful things. So we get a taste for it's true, the and, and the artists can get very like snooty about it and kind of hide things away in a, in a sort of salon mindset. Like, oh, this isn't for the masses. This isn't for the plebes. Like, this is, you know, only for the intellectuals. And I just that's garbage. But which is, I think, why I like illustration so much because it is a very populist kind of, you know, approach to making art. It's like you're trying to communicate. A mess, not just a message, but like a text. You know, you're trying to make it um, not just easy for people to understand, but to like deepen their understanding of whatever it is they're reading. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite author? Who's your favorite author? Uh, Dostoevsky's hard to beat. Um, Chaim Potok is. Who's that? He wrote The Chosen and um, uh, My Name Is Asher Lev. Okay. Yeah, Jewish American writer. Mm. It's amazing. Chaim Potok. Who's that brilliant American author who just died? He wrote The Road and um, Cormac McCarthy. You ever uh, read Cormac McCarthy? No, we ha- I have oh, some books at home. Holy crap, but... he's incredible. Yeah. It's nice when you encounter modern art. You're like, oh, this. it's not like this isn't possible anymore. Yeah. It's yeah. really hard to go from Dostoevsky to anything. It very much is, yeah. I, as I said, I've been reading the Brothers Karamazov for ten years, like my first reading. Okay. Yeah, I'm taking yeah. it real slow. I'm I'm very much like a like I take a bite, I chew on it for like a year, oh my God. you know. How and sad with him, is you can do that. <laughs> stinking Lizaveta. Talk about the simpleton. Yeah. It was so beautiful how the village loved her and mm-hmm. clothed her. I, there's nobody that um, understands human psychology like Dostoevsky. Oh my God. And I always read Brothers when I'm writing. Okay. Yeah, always. I don't read a lot of fiction when I'm writing because I don't want to get other yep. people's voices yeah. in my head, especially like any contemporary. Yeah. I don't really love a lot of contemporary writing. <laughs> How do you find your work satisfactory when you know it's not Dostoevsky? Like, do you ever write and go, this is just shit? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and you, you, it's like, you have to suppress the gag reflex of your own, <laughs> you know, your own mediocrity. And yeah. just kind of press forward and be like, well, it's I'm telling this story. And so I have to trust that God gave me this idea for this time. You know, I'm about to embark on another book right now. Um, that's I'm pretty excited about. And this is after, like, I told myself back in the fall that I was done with writing. Really? I, I actually quit. Why yeah, did after you quit? I came back from Rome, I quit. Why? It's really hard. Writing fiction is unbelievably hard. It takes me two or three years to write a book. Um, most most authors are not bestsellers. Mm-hmm. Like ninety nine percent of us are not bestsellers um, because there's there's just a different set of parameters that publishers are looking for to to make bestsellers, and they're the ones that are more, you know, popular sensibility or whatever. And I'm I'm dealing with like really hard stuff in my books, you know, Holocaust, plague totalitarianism, like burgeoning the, you know, issues in our own culture and whatever, and, you know, trying to tie those in historically. And I don't shy away from stuff. And I think that's not everybody's favorite flavor. So what's your gauge on whether or not your book was actually good if it's not sales? So what do you look to, to go, okay, I think I, I really trust my team. Um, I'm at Knopf. Uh, Penguin Random House, mm-hmm. and they're, they're a really literary house, um, or a really literary imprint within Penguin Random House. So I trust that if they want me to still keep writing books, that yeah. um, there there's something that they're seeing maybe that I'm not. But I also just kind of feel like my grid is: am I being true to this character? Am I, or am I imposing something Oof. on O'Connor them? O'Connor talks about that. About how we got to shy away from making our characters, our puppets, to say our little. Absolutely, and you can smell that yeah. a mile away. Oh my gosh! And to be honest, a lot of young adult fiction is like that. Mm. It's like it breaks the fourth wall so badly, and you just hear the author's agenda, and it's not fun to read. It's, it's really boring. sad. It's really boring. It reminds me of you know, the cheesy Christian films. Yeah. It's the same thing. Where it's no longer a story, it's just a sermon. It's just a sermon and it's or, or an allegory, like a straight one-to-one allegory. Yeah. And you're like, uh, 
this is drudgery. I can't get past like 15 pages in those books. Sorry. Like I'm a slow reader. I'm a chewer. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to devote my time to a book, oh man, it's got to be really good. Do you read your books to your husband as you're writing them? Or? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. He's like my number one editor and he'll tell me, cut this. This is crap. He, he can be like necessarily brutal mm -hmm. and kind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's, he's definitely also my biggest cheerleader. But I think because we're both artists, you know, we, we know where we're coming from and like we want to help each other get better. Um, so it's, it's been a really harmonious match. Thank God. I've had the experience a lot of like writing a short story and rewriting it and rewriting it and spending so much time in it that it's like there's no flavor for me left in it. I mm -hmm. hate it so much. But then I find out it's actually not as bad as I thought because yeah. it was just that I had spent so much time in it. Is that your experience or no? Yeah, it's really hard to detach from the thing that you've created and not see all the flaws in it. Like with my illustrations, I like as I'm working on them, I'm like, oh, this is so life giving. I like I'm communing with the Lord as I'm mm. painting. It's like such a rich experience. And then I get the book and I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, like I don't like how I drew that hand. And, you know, oh, this composition's all wrong or like, why did I use that color? Mm -hmm. You know, so I just see the flaws, but I just have to trust like. If other people are having an emotional connection to it and they're getting something out of it, I just have to release that, you know. What What do you think of the stereotype that all artists are moody and melancholic? Is that you and your husband's experience I'm, or no? I'm not. No. I'm really not emotionally driven. I'm mm -hmm. like very kind of facts and logic. Okay. Yeah. I think there are people like that. Um, and for like, I don't really deal with the Enneagram anymore, but it kind of helped me to see like, oh, there are like among my art friends, mm -hmm. just different kinds of personalities. <laughs> I won't say it out loud, but <laughs> that was... Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and a lot of them are that. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm double that. Mm. Yeah, skullcracker. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just don't, please don't waste my time. Uh, I got work to do, you know. Yeah, because your husband is a, a filmmaker. Yeah. Again, this is another experience where like people send me stuff all the time. And right. I think you said to me, like my husband did this little film. And, and you're probably like, bless his heart. I'm like, oh, I'm sure it's great. But like, yeah, I'm yeah. not going to watch it because yeah. I don't know you. I don't know him. It's, and, yeah, then I, and then I, and I started watching. I'm like, holy crap. Yeah, he's really good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's really good. Wow. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were talking about the Sound of Freedom movie. Yeah. What, yeah. what did you think of that? We were supposed to go together last night, but I was so yeah. happy. And forgive me, but I'm going to repeat it for our listeners. Yeah. It was all sold out. Yeah. I'm like, what about the next showing? Sold out. Sold unless you out. want to sit in the On front row. On a Monday row. night. Yeah, and then tonight, sold out. Yeah. Unless you want to go to like 11 p.m. showing. Yeah. Like, I want to go tonight, but I'm pretty sure it's sold out. Yeah, you're going to have to like book it a week in advance or something. Yeah, it was really it was really good. We talked a lot about it this morning because um, Ben does make a lot of films dealing with sex, with sex trafficking. Does he? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, what was his take on it? He thought it was really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, he... Th he thought like, you know, we had a conversation about the filmmaking aspects of it and yeah. he felt like, oh, I have the same criticisms of it that I would have with any other film, right? And yeah. he, but he's like an insider. He knows what he's looking at. Um, but he felt like this is absolutely something that needs to be talked about. And the, the reception that it's getting, the negative reception that it's getting is shameful. Why? Because people that are downplaying the trafficking of trafficking of children as a problem. Are they downplaying it or are they? Or, or attributing it to conspiracy theories I or whatever. See. It's like, yeah. I'm sorry if you're dismissing it, yeah. you, then you're part of the problem. Yeah. If you're trying to sweep this under the rug, like what's wrong with you? Cause this is happening. Yeah. If you don't, <laughs> even if you have criticisms, if you don't lead with a seriously sympathetic foot. Yes. <laughs> like if your first thing is just to pull it apart, Right. As opposed to, of course, this is happening. My God, thank God, someone's like, beginning to address it. Yeah. And yet I have these criticisms. Fine. With, critique it on its merits. Yeah. It's it's the same thing with, you know, books or art of any kind. It's like critique it on its merits. Don't make ad hominem attacks about the people who are creating it. Like, what is the problem it's trying to address? Take um, it for that. I want to see. You know? what's, how's it doing? I want to see how it's doing. Weren't they trying to get like. Two million. Let's see. This came viewers. out 15 hours ago. Sound of Freedom earns 40 million at the box office. Mm. An independent dramatic thriller. Yada, yada, yada. 
has made 40 million since the 4th of July, right behind Indi- Insidious, The Red Door, and Indiana Jones. But it was above those. It was crowdfunded. Right? Yeah. I think on the, I don't know if it was ever above it, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. I think the first day it brought in more. Okay. Than Indiana Jones. Is that right? Relative to budget. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. Relative to budget and given the fact that it's not in nearly as many yeah, theaters. Yeah, if you adjusted yeah. for the budget of the movie and the number of theaters showing it, it like doubled Indiana Jones on that, like those adjustments. Yeah. Not straight. I think it was like four, maybe almost. I'm try- I see the numbers in my head. Like I can see the shape of the numbers. I can't remember what the, sh- the numbers actually are because mm-hmm. I was looking at the chart the other day. It made, it made like is, 50% less maybe of Indiana Jones, but if you adjusted for the budget of the movie and how many theaters right. you know, Indy was in, yeah. Mm. Um, Angels, like, speak of a cringy name, like Angel Studios, I think of that, I just think that sounds, whatever, it sounds yeah. on the too on the nose. Right. However, they're doing this stuff. Well, look. It says, look at this, His Only Son, I haven't seen that. But I've seen the trailer for that. Came one. in fourth behind Dungeons and Dragons, John Wick 4 and Scream 6 at the box office right. in April. I also really like their VidAngel project. It's really cool. Are you familiar with that project? No. I I know the fellow who started VidAngel. We spoke at a conference together. This was back before it was mainstream. Um, but I didn't know that the two of them are, are collaborating. I think VidAngel and Angel Studios are, are okay. the same company. Oh. Um, but VidAngel is a really cool thing. It's basically it, if if you have a streaming service, you connect that streaming service to your VidAngel account. And then you can tell VidAngel what you don't want to see and what you're watching, mm. and it'll skip those scenes for you. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Like, I deal with dark stuff in my books, but there's stuff I can't tolerate. Dude. Like, there's stuff that... I've heard stories that I can't repeat, even off camera. They've, they were so traumatizing to yeah. hear. Yeah. I mean, the first the first 10 minutes of Sound of Freedom, like, I was definitely triggered. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Oh, I did ask you that before the show, given yeah. your past. Yeah, it was hard to take. Like I was sweating, I you know, and and I've done a lot of work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I've had a, had a lot of therapy, like a lot of therapy um, and a lot of healing from the Lord, but it was in, hard. In that therapy, we mentioned earlier how un, what do you say, treated trauma kind of yeah. shows up in physical ailments later on, like it, it comes back. Yeah. What healing, if any, have you experienced through therapy? Mm. Physically, mentally? Yeah, well, actually, wait till my wife comes in. Ah. She's right here. Hello, Cameron. Hi. Hey, you want to come in and take a seat? I just asked this question supernaturally. Cam, uh, Cam took... do you want my mic? Oh, no, it's, I, I, that's okay. That's not, I just wanted her to hear it. Thank you, though. Um, nice I was, I was asking Vespa, who experienced uh, sexual abuse as a very young child, about, um, well, you say it better than me, how trauma shows back up in bodily ailments and things he didn't expect. And I wanted to ask you about your healing of that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's been said so many times, you know, like the body keeps the score that book, um, that childhood trauma can take up residence in the body. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, um, it, it most definitely did. I didn't unpack it till many, many years later, but, um, from the time I was about 15, um, I developed a chronic pain disease and, I had for 20 years, you know, I, I wanted to die sometimes. It was just. Uh, what, what, when you say, what is that? What, what was the, how, what were you diagnosed with? I was ultimately diagnosed with fibromyalgia, but okay. it didn't seem to really like. Is that it was like also, a catch all? It was at a time somewhere. where fibromyalgia also wasn't very understood. Um, but I still deal with some pain and I do have like other chronic ailments, but um yeah, the that pain disorder just like it had me um, flat for for twenty years. You know, trying to like raise my babies. You know, at the time, you know, and trying to make work because you know part of it is the brain fog and you can't put two thoughts together and you're trying to like make work and it you're just it feels like you're just rolling this boulder up the hill all the time, all the time. So, um, but I I was healed from that. Um, I think partly supernaturally and partly it's kind of crazy. Okay, so 10 years ago I had a car accident and um, the nerve here is paralyzed. So yeah. my, the only movement I have in my arm is like from the two oh. other nerves back here. Um, but so I was- So can you lift your arm up? I, you know, to an extent. I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I have all sorts of like ways of telescoping. Uh-huh. 
<laughs> like you'd never know. And uh -huh. I worked really hard so that you'd never know. Okay. I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so I've worked with a disability for 10 years and in the beginning I couldn't hold my paintbrush. I like, I had no motor control in my fingers. So I was in full-time rehab for two years, um, four days a week, like full days of rehab, chiropractic, physical therapy, acupuncture, massage, like anything I could do. Yeah. And um, it healed the fibromyalgia. What specifically? All of it? I think all of, I think all the body work, it, um, it rewired my brain, I think is what happened. Um, and there's some people who deal with fibromyalgia who, and chronic fatigue and things like that, because I think what we know about fibromyalgia is that it is a misfiring of the brain. It's not fake pain. It's not all in your head. It's just that the brain is perceiving things as pain that aren't pain. So I think with all of that um, body work, it rewired me. I don't know how else to say other than the Lord's healing. Um, I'm very grateful that I don't deal with that anymore. I feel like I would deal with the paralysis. Really? Fine. I can deal with that. But being in pain all the time is, uh, yeah, it's a different kind of, it's a cross. It's a cross. Did you car carry it with grace, do you think? I hope so. Yeah. Did, I mean, I think. Did you grow in your ability to carry it? I mean. Yeah. I think because I, I think because I met the Lord so personally and so intimately, I always felt like he was with me in that. Mm. Um, and, you know, we talked about the wound in Christ's side. This is part of it. The writing is also part of that. So my first book was about the Holocaust. And uh, a lot of it was because I was trying to relearn a lot of my Jewish upbringing and answer questions that I had that we never talked about and things about Jewish history. And um, But anybody who's written about the Holocaust will tell you that it changes you utterly forever. Um, the things that you have to put yourself through and look at and digest, especially if you're trying to translate that for young readers who are other people's children and you don't want to traumatize them with the things that you have then traumatized yourself with. But I always felt like the Lord um, equipped me to be able to do that work because I had endured on the front end of life, you know, I had sort of paid on the mm -hmm. front end of life with that trauma. So I felt like he was with me in that. He'll be with me in this. And um, at a certain point, um, he showed me um, another vision, and it was of uh, we were we were going down a a dark hallway, way, way, way underground, like in a bunker, you know. And it was this narrow, dark hallway, and in the walls were all these little doors with keys. And we turned to this one door, and he put a key in my hand, and just a little door. And I unlocked it, and inside was his sorrow. And he gave me that. Mm. So that's where I live. Mm. Did you ever go to therapy other than rehab? Many, many, many years of therapy. Yeah. Was, was that also helpful in trauma recovery? Yeah. Incredibly helpful. Yeah, I had a Christian therapist, um, thank God. Mm. Yeah, who really kind of helped me see where the Lord was in all of the trauma. Um, and he was there. And that's a hard thing to accept, especially when you're talking about child sexual abuse. Like, how how could the Lord just sit idly by and let it happen, right? Um, and I don't know, you know, like that's not up to me to know. Um, just like when I visited Auschwitz, like, mm. I was like, where are you? You know, where were you in this? And his answer to me was, it was everywhere. What does that mean? I, I put my hand over my mouth. I, I can't answer that question, what it means. I just know that it is, you know. I'm sure we have people watching who have experienced similar sexual abuse and other forms of abuse who wonder whether it's okay to be angry at God. Yeah. Um, because a anger is honest. There's, I think there's a difference between mm. anger and rage too. Yeah. You know, I had rage for a long, long time. I still have anger. I think I'm... I think I'm somebody who is sort of naturally angry. And I think that if... I just wake up that way. You know what? Uh, <laughs> Damn it. It's too early. <laughs> when you say like there was no cynicism or sarcasm yeah. in that, I'm yeah. like, uh, I'm just <laughs> hide myself away. But 
Um, no, but I think that the Lord, like if, if he hadn't hijacked me, okay, which was very much what happened. He came, I was in a pit. I was in the abyss. He literally came and yanked me out of it, hijacked me totally. If he hadn't done that, I often think like, at the time when that happened, like, was I this great sinner? You know, like I wasn't on drugs. I wasn't sleeping around, you know? Yeah, I was into some spiritual stuff, like, you know, mm -hmm. but like, was I this great sinner or whatever? The answer is yes, mm -hmm. but, um, but what did he save me from? And the answer is my anger. Like, I think now about who I would be if he hadn't, and I would just be the bitterest, most degraded, shell of a person and I think what he did was he took that fundamental aspect of my personality that anger and he channeled it into being angry at the right things mm. you know like I will not sweep the abuse under the rug I will not sweep the people that hurt me under the rug like that's very real and I'm not going to apologize for them or make excuses or you know what I mean but I can acknowledge that without casting that at the Lord's feet you know, I heard, you know, who John Eldridge is. Yeah. Love him. I, I was, love, I, I woke up with Stacy Eldridge on my mind this morning. So it's mm. interesting. Tell me. He gave a talk in which he led men through a prayer experience and invited them to forgive God. Yeah. And he immediately anticipated the interior kind of rejection. Those of us who have had any theology training yeah. would have. And he said, you just need to trust me because you, you cannot, you cannot, trust who you haven't forgiven and so in one sense god is perfect and all spotless mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i thought there was tremendous wisdom in that and i i wondered if that would be good advice for those who've experienced abuse yeah i think that's not necessarily my experience mm. of needing i didn't really need to do that i think i needed to trust God's goodness that he really was for me and that I belonged to him and was safe with him. That was the avenue. Yeah. Yeah. So that I could know who to direct my anger at. Um, interestingly, the, the people who, uh, who did these things to me are, are dead. Mm -hmm. Um, the world feels a lot lighter without them in it. I hate to say that. Yeah. Um, but you know, you can, direct your your righteous anger at the people who do evil like that's we should like you know we should know where to direct that mm -hmm. but at the same time like we have to we have to release them to god's justice you know because he's in the business of perfect justice like he's able to give the the victim perfect mercy and the perpetrator perfect justice but it also at the same time makes me tremble for those people you know, my father, who I never met, is dead. My God, you know, like, I don't want to think of my father having to stand before the Lord and give account for what he did. Um, but I also have to just release him to the Lord. I can't. How do you do that? It's muscle memory. Yeah. You know? Nicely done. Nicely done. <laughs> did, what did you just drop? A microphone? microphone. Damn it. <laughs> Why were you even taking it off? <laughs> Sorry. Um, were you trying to give it to her or? Uh, oh, did you want to talk? Uh, she doesn't even want to talk. <laughs> you can come here and talk if you want to. <laughs> so, um, no, because I hear you hear people talking about forgiveness being a choice. Mm -hmm. And I just. I think a fair question is, what does that even mean? And I wondered, it's probably similar to releasing someone. Yeah. But I wondered what that means. To... I read something years ago. I don't remember what it what it was called or who wrote it. But um, I'm just sorry. I got to get this out. I'm yeah. laughing because after that gigantic crash, I just look at Thursday and he's like, <laughs> like <laughs> even though it doesn't sound like it, everything's fine. Everything's cool. <laughs> I feel really bad because I like don't feel set bad, it down fine. and reached over to mute it and <laughs> I didn't get to it. As it hit the floor, I just heard in my headphones, hey, the dude, student, the monitor, listen. like, boom, 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 boom. So I know everyone is just like. <laughs> As I told you when I was at Daily Wire and Candace was doing her little one person thing, 
I walked into the dark room. There was at least 15 people working on her show. So you yeah. got to do that many people's wow. jobs. You're crushing it. Yeah, oh, don't gosh. feel bad. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, sorry about that. I apologize <laughs> to the audience and to the audio <laughs> listeners. I'm going to cut that out of the audio. I'm going to have to. <laughs> and it'll be easy to find, too. It's in the, just going to be yeah, exactly. it's just yeah. straight up. Forgiveness. And, um, yeah, so it was about sowing and reaping. And it was about, like, if you sow unforgiveness... Like when when you hold people to uh, when you don't release them to forgiveness, right? You you wind up reaping anger and reaping bitterness yourself, right? It, it's, a, it's a little bit of a variation on the like um, forgiveness benefits you more than the other person kind of. But I don't. I feel like there is something more going on spiritually in the in the sort of relationship between that person and God and you. It's mm. like. I don't know any other way to say it, but the, but to release them to his justice, you know, like the the woman who hit me in this car accident. Yeah, I had to pray that for two years while I was waiting to get justice in that regard, because she took something from me. You know, she took my full function of my working arm as an artist. You know, and I just had to choose. Like, I am not going to give myself over to bitterness or offense with this. I'm I'm going to forgive her and I'm going to release her to let God deal with her, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I don't harbor bitterness toward her. You know, it's now and now I can see all of all of this stuff as just part of my story. And if I can recognize that and put it into my work, then I have more understanding of of human nature, of the psychology of the characters I'm writing. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not I'm not really willing to write anybody off. Um, not willing to draw hard lines and say, well, like I will, I'll only deal with these kinds of people that are like me or I don't know. I, I want to have relationships with all different kinds of people, even if I don't agree with them or I find their views reprehensible or whatever. I want to understand like, you know, mm -hmm. how did this person become who they are? I want to, I want to close in a prayer, but, yeah. um, I wanted to ask you if there's anything else you wanted to touch on before we begin to wrap up. No, I feel like we could talk forever so we probably shouldn't oh we could too <laughs> yeah is there any place you want to point people we have links in your to your instagram to your books to your illustrations below um i think i gave you those links yeah. um yeah, but yeah in. i think um i always love hearing from readers you know about how the books are yeah kind of intersecting with them and um with their own stories so hopefully you know people will read them so but keep going. Be before you do that, um, I think what I really want to tie things together with is just um, how good the Lord is. Okay. How loving, how sweet, how kind. Mm. He's been so unbelievably kind to me. I don't deserve it at all, not for a minute. And he just keeps meeting with me with his kindness again and again and again and again. And I, I don't get it, you know, but he, he just keeps showing up. And I get the the sense all the time that he is just putting his arm around me saying, let's go, let's go on another adventure. Let's do something else. You know, he's, he's, that's available for, for all of us. Yeah. So I wanted to pray this prayer with you. And I thought what we could do is take it paragraph by paragraph. Yeah. And I want to invite people to pray along with us. This was written by John Eldridge. Mm. <laughs> so I printed it off this morning so we could pray it. I just felt like the Lord wanted this oh i'm sorry i'm gonna interrupt you again because yeah. i said stacy eldridge yeah and this kind of plays into what i was getting at her book captivating opened up for me before i became a writer um the the image of god living in every person it changed the way that i see people and when when i see people of all kinds even if i don't like them there's something of that spark of the of the divine image that i I'm, I can see now. Um, and that came from her book. Mm. Like, I feel like people are just like on fire with glory all the time. So take that for what you will. Yeah. Praise God. Eldridge's. All right. You feel up for this? Yeah. I didn't ask you beforehand. I that's, just, uh, that's cool. All right. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I'm in. My dear Lord Jesus, I come to you now to be restored in you, renewed in you to receive your life and your love and all the grace and mercy I so desperately need this day. 
I honor you as my Lord, and I surrender every aspect and dimension of my life to you. I give you my spirit, soul, and body, my heart, mind, and will. I cover myself with your blood, my spirit, soul, and body, my heart, mind, and will. I ask your Holy Spirit to restore me in you, renew me in you, and lead this time of prayer. In all that I now pray, I stand in total agreement with your Spirit and with all those praying for me by the Spirit of God and by the Spirit of God alone. Dearest God, holy and victorious Trinity, you alone are worthy of all my worship, my heart's devotion, all my praise, all my trust, and all the glory of my life. I love you. I worship you. I give myself over to you in my heart's search for life. You alone are life and you have become my life. I renounce all other gods, every idol, and I give to you, God, the place in my heart and in my life that you truly deserve. This is all about you and not about me. You are the hero of this story, and I belong to you. I ask your forgiveness for my every sin. Search me, know me, and reveal to me where you are working in my life and grant to me the grace of your healing and deliverance and a deep and true repentance. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me and choosing me before you made the world. You are my true Father, my Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, and the true end of all things, including my life. I love you, I trust you, I worship you. I give myself over to you, Father, to be one with you as Jesus is one with you. Thank you for proving your love for me by sending Jesus. I receive him and all his life and all his work which you ordained for me. Thank you for including me in Christ, forgiving me my sins, granting me his righteousness, making me complete in him. Thank you for making me alive with Christ, raising me with him, seating me with him at your right hand establishing me in his authority and anointing me with your love and your spirit and your favor. I receive it all with thanks and give it total claim to my life, my spirit, soul, and body, my heart, mind, and will. Jesus, thank you for coming to ransom me with your own life. I love you, worship you, trust you. I give myself over to you to be one with you in all things. I receive all the work and triumph of your cross, death, blood, and sacrifice for me, through which my every sin is atoned for. I am ransomed, delivered from the kingdom of darkness, and transferred to your kingdom. My sin nature is removed, my heart circumcised unto God, and every claim being made against me is canceled and disarmed. Amen. I take my place now in your cross and death, dying with you to sin, to my flesh, to this world, to the evil one and his kingdom. I take up the cross and crucify my flesh with all its pride, arrogance, unbelief, and idolatry and cowardice. I'll add that. I put off the old man. Apply to me all the work and triumph in your cross, death, blood, and sacrifice. I receive it with thanks and give it total claim to my spirit, soul, and body, my heart, mind, and will. Jesus, I also receive you as my life, and I receive all the work and triumph in your resurrection through which you have conquered sin, death, judgment, and the evil one. Death has no power over you nor does any foul thing. And I have been raised with you to a new life, to live your life dead to sin and alive to God. I take my place now in your resurrection and in your life, and I give my life to you to live your life. I am saved by your life. I reign in life through your life. I receive your hope, love, faith, joy, your goodness, trueness, wisdom, power, and strength. Apply to me all the work and triumph in your resurrection. I receive it with thanks, and I give it total claim to my spirit, soul, and body, my heart, mind, and will. Jesus, I also severe, severely, sincerely, I severely too, receive you as my authority 
rule, and dominion, my everlasting victory against Satan and his kingdom, and my ability to bring your kingdom at all times and in every way. I receive all the work and triumph in your ascension, through which Satan has been judged and cast down, and all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. All authority in the heavens and on this earth has been given to you, Jesus, and you are worthy to receive all glory and honor, power and dominion now and forever. I take my place now in your authority and in your throne, through which I have been raised with you to the right hand of the Father and established in your authority. I give myself to you to reign with you always. Apply to me all the work and triumph in your authority and your throne. I receive it with thanks and I give it total claim to my spirit, soul, and body, my heart, mind, and will. And I now bring the authority, rule, and dominion of the Lord Jesus Christ and the full work of Christ over my life today, over my home, my household, my work, over all my kingdom and domain. I bring the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and the full work of Christ against every evil power coming against me, against every foul spirit, every foul power and device. I cut them off in the name of the Lord. I bind and banish them from me and from my kingdom now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I also bring the full work of Christ between me and every person, and I allow only the love of God and only the Spirit of God between us. Amen. Holy Spirit, thank you for coming. I love you. I worship you. I trust you. I receive all the work and triumph in Pentecost, through which you have come. You have clothed me with power from on high, sealed me in Christ, become my union with the Father and the Son, the Spirit of truth in me, the life of God in me, my counselor, comforter, strength, and guide. I honor you as Lord, and I fully give to you every aspect and dimension of my spirit, soul, and body, my heart, mind, and will, to be filled with you, to walk in step with you in all things. Fill me afresh, Holy Spirit. Restore my union with the Father and the Son. Lead me into all truth, anoint me for all of my life and walk and calling, and lead me deeper into Jesus today. I receive you now with thanks, and I give you total claim to my life. Heavenly Father, thank you for granting to me every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. I claim the riches in Christ Jesus over my life today. I bring the blood of Christ once more over my spirit, soul, and body over my heart, mind, and will. I put on the full armor of God, the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the gospel, helmet of salvation. I take up the shield of faith and sword of the Spirit, and I choose to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of your might to pray at all times in the Spirit. Jesus, thank you for your angels. I summon them in the name of Jesus Christ and instruct them to destroy all that is raised against me, to establish your kingdom over me, to guard me day and night. I ask you to send forth your spirit to raise up prayer and intercession for me. I now call forth the kingdom of God throughout my home, my household, my kingdom and domain and this studio in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving all glory and honor and thanks to him. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks.